Last August in 1991, I had an unforgettable experience that still sends shivers down my spine. You see, I own a cozy condo at Smuggler's Cove near Newport, Oregon, nestled amidst the beauty of nature. Little did I know that this serene getaway would become the backdrop for an encounter that defied all logic and reason. It all began when my friend Michael, who also happened to be a park ranger, shared a chilling report with me. He had encountered something truly extraordinary at Smuggler's Cove. Eager to explore the mystery further, I decided to visit the area and witness it for myself. I arrived at my condo, situated near a tranquil lake, accompanied by my sister April, her husband, and their young son. The peacefulness of the surroundings set the stage for an idyllic vacation, or so we thought. One evening, as the sun began to set, we gathered on the balcony, enjoying the breathtaking view of the lake. Suddenly, something caught our attention. A figure emerged from the dense foliage on the opposite side of the lake. It was unlike anything we had ever seen before. Towering and robust, this creature appeared to be a Bigfoot. The creature possessed no discernible neck and was covered in long, jet-black hair, which swayed with each powerful stride it took. As it walked along the edge of the lake, it seemed to move with an uncanny grace, despite its immense size. The sight was both mesmerizing and terrifying. As we stood there awestruck, our initial disbelief transformed into a shared sense of awe and bewilderment. It wasn't just my own eyes that witnessed this enigmatic creature. My sister April, her husband, and their son were equally captivated by the sight before us. Time seemed to stand still as we watched the Bigfoot navigate the surroundings with an almost supernatural presence. Its existence defied all rational explanation. We were witnessing a phenomenon that challenged the boundaries of our understanding. Our hearts raced, and a mix of fear and fascination gripped us. We exchanged nervous glances, realizing that our lives were forever changed by this encounter. It was a moment that would bind us together in a shared secret, forever etched in our memories. In the days that followed, we tried to make sense of what we had witnessed. I wasn't exactly hunting. I had a nice 94 Camaro and I needed new tire due to being a stupid teenager with a powerful car. I knew where I could get some nice tires, but I had to steal them from a guy that once stole my car and drove it into a lake. We parked across the highway in a clearing in front of a cornfield. We got there we each grabbed a tire and was working on throwing them in the car when we heard like a croaking noise. We looked over and saw something very human-like, but like three foot tall that ran fast as shit out of the corn and into the distance all within about three seconds. We all saw it and no one believes us. We got the tires in the car and got the hell out of there fast. Not exactly spooky, but when I was in boot camp, I was in ship six name of the barracks about three months after they reopened it. It had been closed for about five years prior and was still going through renovations while we were there. Around midnight to four weird shit would happen. It was likely the symptom of sleep deprivation, but you'd always hear footsteps, occasionally see something moving outside the porthole on the door to the open bay, and everyone on the second and third decks swore they saw either a recruit or horse walking around up there. Thing is, some dude did kill himself in that building a couple years before they closed it. Or so I'd been told. At my current station, though, there's a bunch of vampire deer that make it onto base, and last year when I was on nights, there was a deer that liked the parking lot outside my building. We have cameras that cover said parking lot, and I once saw that deer looking up at the camera for a minute or two. At first it was spooky to see a deer with fangs look right back at me, but then it got kind of cool and unsettling. This was about five years ago, me, my mom, and my dad were camping at Mary Jane Thurston State Park, just outside Grand Rapids, Ohio. It was around the end of August, the beginning of September. Our campsite was in the front part of the campgrounds. Leading up to the two separate incidents, we occasionally heard what we thought could have been a bird of some kind screaming or screeching up in the trees, 
or at least it sounded like it was coming from the top of the trees. We'd hear it almost every night, but in a different location. We'd hear it in the trees behind us one night. Then the next night it would come from the other end of the campgrounds, then the night after we'd hear it from across the road. I've listened to the sounds of different animals, including owls, to see if that was the noise we heard, but nothing is even close. Occasionally we'd hear what sounded like branches being snapped, but thought nothing of it. I had my own tent, and that detail is somewhat important as it factors into the second incident. First incident. My dad woke up in the middle of the night to what sounded like someone was rummaging through the ice chest, which was sitting between our tents. He said he then heard whoever or whatever it was shut the cooler and walk away. He told me and my mom about it the next day. The odd thing was that nothing was missing from the cooler. Second incident happened the night after the first one. I had a little small TV and my game console in my tent. I was watching a movie when I hear something approach our campsite. Whatever it is went through the cooler again. I could hear the ice moving around as it was rummaging through the cooler. I was as SGLLL and as quiet as possible. But whoever, or I should say whatever it was knew I was awake, because it decided to put its massive hand on the side of my tent and push it in. I was frozen with fear and didn't know what to do. It felt like forever, but was only about 20 seconds before it took its hand from my tent and walked away. I didn't even think about looking for tracks the next day. We don't have bears in this part of Ohio, so I definitely know it wasn't a bear. This thing didn't take anything from the ice chest despite going through it twice. I know when it put its hand on my tent and pushed it in a little, I was frozen with fear. We know it wasn't some homeless person or anyone else because there was maybe five campsites that had anyone, and they were in the back part of the campground. In August of 2010, I had my very own sighting of something similar while working third shift patrol with another deputy for Dallas County Precinct 3 Constable's office near Forney, Texas. At the time, I was stopped at the intersection of County Road 298 and Still Bridge Road, facing eastbound on CR 298 with my emergency lights activated. As I scanned the surroundings, I noticed something unusual moving northbound off to my left in a small wooded area. Initially, it appeared to be a large armadillo or some other rodent seeking shelter in the brush. However, it quickly became apparent that this creature was different. It was agile and swift, moving through the thick undergrowth with remarkable speed. Though it didn't seem overly large at first, it maintained a safe distance as it zigzagged between the trees, steadily approaching me at approximately 15 miles an hour. What struck me most was its long mane and shaggy hair, reminiscent of a horse, but its movements were unlike anything I had ever witnessed. It seemed almost alien and robotic, walking upright on two legs, covering ground with long strides akin to someone running through tall grass pretending to be Tarzan. As the creature drew nearer, about 65 feet away from my location, I decided to step out of my vehicle. At that moment, I could hear dogs barking in the distance. Seemingly at the same time, this creature emerged from the trees on the other side of CR 298. It locked eyes with me momentarily, its expression suggesting surprise or regret, before swiftly retreating into the brush, disappearing from sight. Estimating its height at around five feet, and noting its slender build and thick hair, I remained at the scene for about 15 minutes, half expecting it to reappear on the other side of the brush. However, it never did. Despite the proximity between us, separated only by a ditch and several trees, I didn't sense any aggression directed towards me. If the creature harbored any ill intentions, it could have easily reached me. In that area, residents frequently report sightings of stray dogs and feral hogs, as people often discard unwanted pets into those woods. However, nobody seems to know the true identity of this enigmatic creature. Perhaps the abandoned pets serve as a food source for this mysterious entity. Furthermore, a third deputy also reported seeing tracks believed to be from the same creature in a similar location. Unfortunately, after several weeks of attempting to relocate the tracks, they were lost. It surprises me that this phenomenon is not more widely known, 
especially considering the number of reports made over the years by numerous individuals in the area. Some witnesses even claim to have heard blood-curdling screams resembling a woman being murdered, emanating from deep within those very woods. Despite thorough investigations, no evidence of violent deaths or missing persons matching these descriptions has ever been found. Official explanations for these events typically range from wild dogs and coyotes to escaped exotic pets like monkeys and lions. However, some locals entertain the possibility of an undiscovered species, such as a Sasquatch or an undocumented breed of primate. The only clue we have ever stumbled upon was a single set of prints, later identified as belonging to a man's work boot, likely dropped accidentally during his normal duties. It leaves us wondering if there truly is something out there, lurking right under our noses, waiting to be discovered. In 1995, my marine company woke up before sunrise at 29 Palm Springs. It was around 5.30 in the morning, and we were all gathered, sitting on our backpacks, awaiting orders. Suddenly, our attention was captured by five brilliant lights emerging from behind a hill roughly 200 feet away. These lights swiftly ascended into the sky without making a sound. Then, they started moving in a serpentine manner for several minutes before vanishing from our sight in an instant. Everyone in the company witnessed this phenomenon, including our company commander. To our surprise, he called for a company formation in the dark night, which was quite unusual. Once we were assembled, he addressed us, saying, Listen, we all saw it, and we know what it was. Don't ever speak about this to anyone outside of this company while you're still enlisted. I'll handle it myself. So stay quiet and let's prepare for the patrol. The commander's reaction left us with a sense of intrigue and caution. It was clear that something out of the ordinary had occurred, and he wanted to keep it strictly within our ranks. We followed his instructions and kept the incident to ourselves. Our focus shifted to preparing for the patrol ahead, suppressing any lingering thoughts about the mysterious lights in the dark desert sky. Reflecting back on that experience, it remains a haunting memory, something that happened in the depths of the night, sparking curiosity and leaving us with unanswered questions. I had pitched the tent for the night and was in bed, not yet asleep, was hunting by myself. I heard some commotion outside and thought it to be elk. Next, there was debris being thrown at my tent rocks not big enough to break through. The area was very rocky and was not a slide. I heard some movement above me. I was camped right about 75 yards max from the canyon down into Valsets Valley. Anyway, I kind of just freaked out. It stopped and I went to sleep. The next morning I looked around and found a few rocks laying around, nothing bigger than maybe a baseball. On October 21, 2015, my father fell out of a tree stand. He was not properly harnessed and fell as soon as he started to get down. He hit against several thick branches and broke two parts of his spine and an arm, collarbone, and nose. If his face had been facing slightly to the left, his nose bone would have been projected into his brain and he would be dead. It is a miracle that he survived but he was far from help and was alone, broken and bloody for hours. He manages to somehow drag himself far enough to the edge of the woods to call for help. He had to get two titanium rods put in his back and undergo several surgeries to ensure that he would be able to continue walking. It took over a year and a half for him to achieve any semblance of recovery. On October 21, 2017, he was in a tree stand again. This time, a defect in the stand caused it to collapse and him, in his infinite wisdom, was again unharnessed. He was once again falling from a tree. He was lucky, as the rods in his back prevented his spine from breaking again, and he was closer to the ground than last time. However, he did still break one of his knees and shatter half of his hip. This time, he was able to call for help on a phone he had with him. He has been an addict all of his life, and is now but a shell of his former self. An opiate abuser, there is truly no chance for him to recover. 
While he can walk, his posture is permanently hunched. He looks a hunchback. He moves like an 80-year-old man. He is 44. His pain is permanent and so that he can not even function without the pills he abuses. These accidents have completely destroyed any semblance he could have if a normal life. I myself have never been interested in hunting, but I can say with confidence that he will never step foot in a tree, or perhaps a forest for that matter, ever again. My father saw his death and narrowly evaded it twice. Hunting is not a safe sport. It can be dangerous and in not too extreme cases fatal. Be careful. Long story short, I was walking my dog at night when I saw in the forest, lit up by the orange street lamps, what looked like a deer standing up, but when I looked at its head, I couldn't understand its face. As in, its head face was sort of shrouded in darkness, as if my mind couldn't comprehend what it was seeing. Strange, but explainable. Last night, years after that encounter, nothing strange had happened up to now. I was sleeping, my bedroom situated facing the road, with my windows open. I am normally a deep sleeper, but I woke up to the loud sound of bird noises. At first I thought nothing of it, simply birds calling in the middle of the night. But over time I noticed something. It's hard to describe, but it sounded as if about every five seconds or so, there would be a different bird call. And the calls weren't different sounds, as in certain birds make different pitched noises or hoot, etc. Instead, it was the same whistling noise, not like a whistle blowing, but instead like the noise a songbird would sing, but in different arrangements for an hour straight. It was very loud, loud enough that I covered my head with two pillows and was still woken. It was just repeating the same 50 different calls or so in the same order. It was as if one type of bird was imitating the different calls it heard over and over in the same order. The noise was about 25 feet away, coming from the thicket next to my house. There was no sound but the calling noise. No crickets chirped, no frogs called. Hell, no cars drove through the neighborhood. I also faintly remember the smell of rotten eggs, but this may have been a trick my panicked mind played on me. Eventually it stopped and I fell back asleep, terrified. I had kept my eyes tight shut. I woke up again about 15 minutes later, hearing the sound seemingly further away down the street, but again in the same exact order. Then later through the night, I heard the noise again, either in the same spot as before and louder, or right outside my window. I faced away from the window and kept my eyes shut horrified but in such a tired state that I simply stayed put, not able to think of anything else. What the F was that? Does anyone have an explanation for this? I know my description may sound strange, but it's hard to put in words. All I know for sure was that it was not natural. This wasn't a bird or crickets or a frog, no. It was something else. Edit. Nah, I was wrong on that last part. After checking out a few links and watching a few videos, I think that it was a mockingbird. I've never heard or seen one before, and it was pretty scary hearing its noises right outside for hours and having absolutely no idea what was making those noises. I'm happy now that I know I can keep a window open overnight. I guess this goes to show that a lot of things on this subreddit have rational explanations to them. It's important that we criticize and try to explain stories here so that we can find what truly is irrational and try to come to an answer about these things. On a routine patrol on my Coast Guard cutter in the Eastern Pacific, late at night a few hundred miles offshore. I'm on the helm and the late night bridge watch conversations are the usual. People telling a few spooky stories. The radio crackles suddenly and everyone shuts up since it's monitoring channel 16, which is international hailing and distress. We get static for 20 or 30 seconds, then singing. Someone is singing nonsensibly into their radio. It stops. After a while, and we all kind of freak out. Later in the watch, the bridge windshield wipers turned on on their own. The ocean at night is weird.
My wife, my daughter, and I joined our troop for a Cub Scout Halloween event at a Boy Scout camp in Colorado. It's a large hilly area tucked away in the canyons. There are lots of campsites up the hill, but further down the road are some cabins. We were allowed to stay there for the night since it's more comfortable than tents. Well, these cabins are about a one quarter mile away from any of the other buildings or tent areas. So we are nowhere near the rest of the group and it's just the three of us in the cabin. We get ready for bed and as I'm starting to fall asleep, I realize how eerily quiet it is. It is completely still outside. No wind, no rustling of trees, etc. Well, I eventually fall asleep. I am then awoken very suddenly by a scream inside the room. I sit up and ask my wife if she is okay. She responds yes and checks on our daughter. She is fine. It is now dead quiet again. No noise. The scream is gone. So in a panic I start walking around the room in the dark. Nothing in the room but us. Maybe it came from outside. So I peek out the window and out the front door. No movement, nothing but it's pitch black. I can't see anything. Time to buck up the courage, grab my phone as a flashlight and go check outside. I stand there frozen for a minute and finally work myself up to grab my phone and go outside. I grab my phone, turn on the screen and see a Halloween update alert from the Simpsons mobile game. What I heard was Homer Simpson screaming from my phone because one of my buildings was done in the Simpsons game. Needless to say, I uninstalled that game and haven't played it since. It took a good two hours for my wife and I to call back asleep. My girlfriend and I were fishing at a stone quarry in Sugar Grove, Illinois on May 5, 1988, that was pretty much surrounded by cornfields and some small patches of light forest and shrubbery. The sun had just set, and we were behind stone walls inside the small quarry, so it was getting darker a little faster. On one side of the quarry, the stone wall was elevated 40 feet. That is the side we face while fishing, while the area behind us slowly rose to a cornfield edged by shrubbery and small trees. The edge of the trees and shrubbery is about 15 to 20 yards behind us. We were sitting on the edge of the water contemplating packing up when all of a sudden we heard this very loud roar, and I mean loud. It made us both jump up instantly. It roared howled again. I could see the outline of a creature with a large head and large eyes. I grabbed my flashlight and shined it at the creature. It had very large greenish orangish oval eyes. It roared again and you could see very large predator-like teeth. Then it moved through the trees and shrugged so fast, we could not see it move until it was at its next destination. Then it roared again. It had a roar that was not like anything that lives on this planet, especially in Illinois. I can still mimic the sound that it made. It was very scary. The creature was at its closest 10 yards and maybe 50 yards at its furthest. The eyes reminded me of a large reptile. The next day I went back with my friend to see if I could see anything or any signs of anything. I could not see anything such as tracks or broken limbs. Nothing. My buddy and I started fishing. We were there about an hour when it started to get dark again. We packed up and started to walk up the short path to my jeep when we both stopped in our tracks. Coming across the cornfield at treetop level was a craft. It had several lights on it and it had a large light that shined on us for a few seconds. Then it made a 45 degree turn and went out of the atmosphere in the blink of an eye. The craft we saw did not have a sound. We were pretty much surrounded by the stone quarry. We could hear a pin drop on the other side, but this craft did not have a sound. My encounter happened in July of 1996 in the Trinity Mountains of Northern California. My roommates and I are up for summer break from Humboldt State University, and we decided to go backpacking for the weekend as we often do. We originally planned to visit the Ruth Lake Trailhead, but it was raining hard and our group decided to ask the rangers at the forest station where there was a good place to hike. 
My roommates from the Los Angeles area decided to be smart asses to the ranger at which I was mortified as my dad spent many summers as a park ranger in Crater Lake, Oregon and Mount Rainier. Washington I remember the ranger taking offense and I saw a gleam in his eyes when he pointed out a nice hike for you all. He sent us to a trailhead in the Trinity Alps I only recalled this after the encounter, racking my brain to try and figure out how we ended up in such a surreal situation. We hiked about five miles up Steed Canyon and found a flat piece of real estate next to the Raging Creek. There were some nice granite slabs that we hung out on and bathed from that afternoon, careful not to get swept away by the swollen creek. At around 10 that night we were sitting around a pre-existing campfire on some logs that had been arranged around it in a square. We had all heard voices of what we thought were some people approaching our camp from above. We got ready to greet other backpackers, but realized that they were coming from the top of the mountain down a very steep slope, not the trail that followed the creek of the canyon. Their voices were deep and sounded like the samurai chatter as I've heard it described in other accounts. I couldn't understand it of course, but the tone was unmistakable. Basically, someone is in our territory and we're not happy about it. I directed my crappy flashlight after silhouettes as they skirted our campsite and caught a pair of eyes locked on me. They were whitish yellow, large and far apart. My reaction was one of disbelief and the basic mindset that I seemed to adopt for the rest of the encounter, which I now suppose to be a survival instinct that helped me keep my sanity, as now this isn't really happening to me. I kept telling myself this over and over throughout the encounter. I swung my flashlight off the spot, and then when I came back to it the eyes were gone. Just then the stomping and hooting began, slow at first, and then building to a crescendo. The ground shook with every stomp. We all shared looks of shock and disbelief, and at that moment I experienced the worst fear of my life. I resigned myself to the fact that I would probably die soon. When the stomping and hooting finally stopped, I assumed the voice to be the male as it was deep and commanding. It barked some orders and I thought they were now about to attack. Below us were the higher pitched sounds of the females who responded to the orders. A few moments later we heard huge splashes in the creek from upstream. Either they were throwing huge boulders into the creek or jumping into it. Their voices were excited now, like a party or celebration. Then it went silent maybe a minute or two later. We then heard the siren-like scream from the top of the canyon. I could feel it reverberate in my chest. I've had people try to convince me that these were just some people playing a prank on us. I always respond that there was no way a human can hike up that mountain that fast in pitch blackness. I also don't think anyone can scream that loud, even with amplification. Whatever made that noise was massive. It sounded like the cross between a lion and Tarzan and it seemed to be proclaiming its dominance over the region. I was just relieved that I was still alive and that they had moved farther away. After a while, I lay down in my tent. I heard something walking outside and pulled my sleeping bag from my ears. My tent mate asked if I'd heard anything, but I was still in that this can't be happening mode, so I replied nope. Just then the campfire went dark with the silhouette of the creature. I literally choked on my scream, petrified to make any noise. I could only watch the shadow as I was completely paralyzed. I remember its fingers groping the seam of the zipper and its breath pushing the tent fabric in and out. I can think, but my body couldn't move. I thought I should grab my camera, but was paralyzed with fear. I also remember getting the sensation that the creature knew I was aware of it and scared to death. I must have passed out from fear. I don't remember anything after that until I woke up at daybreak. I searched the area with a very new perspective that morning and found a hair that I've since misplaced. I also noticed the trail had deep impressions, but no clear tracks. Other than that there was no trace of our encounter that night. I've never been shy about telling my story. I will always recount the episode when requested even in potentially skeptical audiences. I've never really worried about what people thought of my account. I know what I encountered even if I didn't get a good look at the creatures. I've endured some ridicule, but I'm not afraid to stand up for what I believe and all who challenge me go away assured that I'm speaking the truth.
They may not believe it, but they all tell me they believe that what happened to me actually occurred. The thing that gets me sometimes is the sounds. Sometimes you'll just hear some animal and it sounds like nothing you've ever heard before and you can't imagine it being anything like any animal you've ever even heard of. That combined with pitch blackness of the woods can creep you the F out. Worst one was a couple months ago sitting under a tarp because it was raining a bit, small fire going a bit away with no other light. Heard a sound with the rhythm you would expect from a bird, but with a deeper sound than any bird ever. Sound continues to repeat every couple seconds and slowly gets louder like it's getting closer then stops. Never heard it again, but those couple minutes until I convinced myself it was gone, I was creeped the F out no doubt. I'm really late to the thread, but one of the dads in my scout crew spent some time doing photography for National Geographic. He would hike out to remote places alone and take photos for a few days. Well, one time he was developing his photography and he saw a bunch of photos of him sleeping. He said he quit shortly after that. Growing up on a farm, I was well acquainted with the strict nature of my father. He was a man of unwavering principles and one rule he held steadfastly was to keep me away from the nearby forest. As a curious child, I often found myself yearning to explore the mysterious depths of those towering trees, but my father's warning echoed in my mind like an unyielding command. The reason behind his strictness was a story that haunted our farm, a story whispered among the locals. Bigfoot, an elusive creature, had been making appearances near our land, causing distress and wreaking havoc. Animals, it was said, had fallen victim to its voracious appetite. But my father, in his usual stern manner, provided no further details. He spoke of the incidents in vague terms, leaving the specifics of the stolen animals shrouded in uncertainty. It had been a year and a half since those mysterious encounters began, casting a shadow of fear and apprehension over our lives. The mere mention of Bigfoot sent shivers down my spine, and my father's protectiveness intensified as he sought to shield me from the perceived danger lurking in the forest's depths. Yet, as I grew older, my curiosity mingled with a longing to unravel the truth behind the tales that swirled around us. The forest beckoned to me, its ancient trees whispering secrets that begged to be discovered. Despite my father's stern warnings, I couldn't suppress the desire to challenge his restrictions and venture closer to the forbidden realm. One fateful day, driven by a mix of fear and fascination, I made my way toward the edge of the forest. The air was heavy with anticipation, a palpable sense of the unknown that enveloped me. With each step, I felt my heart pounding in my chest, a symphony of excitement and trepidation echoing in my ears. As I neared the forest's boundary, a strange sensation washed over me, a mingling of awe and reverence. The canopy of trees above seemed to create a sanctuary of mystery, shielding the secrets within from prying eyes. It was within this ethereal space that Bigfoot had allegedly roamed, leaving a trail of uncertainty in its wake. Silently I pressed on, my senses attuned to every rustle and whisper in the undergrowth. The forest seemed to hold its breath, as if aware of my intrusion. The stolen animals lingered in my thoughts, their fate and the purpose behind their abduction, a riddle yet to be solved. In the depths of the forest, time seemed to blur, the boundaries between reality and myth blending into one. My eyes darted from shadow to shadow, searching for any signs of Bigfoot's presence. Each snap of a twig sent my heart racing, my imagination conjuring images of the elusive creature lurking just out of sight. But as I ventured deeper into the forest's embrace, a realization began to take hold. The stories that had haunted our farm were nothing more than fragments of folklore, woven into the fabric of our collective consciousness. The stolen animals, the fear that gripped us, all seemed to lose their hold on my mind. In that moment, standing amidst the tranquil beauty of nature, I understood the significance of my father's strictness. It was not solely driven by the fear of a mythical creature, but rather a father's love, 
an earnest attempt to shield his daughter from the dangers that lurked beyond our known world. Hunted near Feline Rescue Center and bow hunting one day, I saw a jaguar walking through the woods. It had escaped from the makeshift zoo this guy was running out of his house. I told him his cat was out in the woods. He denies it and said that it was still in the fence, although he had a quarter of beef hanging on the outside of his fence trying to get it to come back. It was out for several weeks and other people in the area saw it as well. It was even a story in the local paper. Finally, he got it back into his fenced area. He has about 100 cats, lions, leopards, jags. He takes them in from closed zoos, circus, and anybody that had a cat as a pet and wants to get rid of it. You can Google it. Feline Rescue Center, Center Point, Indiana. My old friend's family has a vacation house on the Hood Canal of the Puget Sound. It is out in the wilderness with 70 plus acres of land. Only other residents are some cousins, friends, and the landlord. Anyways, me and my friend were driving his ATV through the forest. We looked over and saw a tall black humanoid creature running at the same speed as us. But we were going over 40 miles per hour, and by tall I mean like 10 feet tall. It then started crawling and then disappeared into the trees, and it wasn't just our imaginations, we both saw it. After some frantic driving, we eventually stopped and stepped off, listening to the forest, and we could hear heavy footsteps and branches cracking, and we returned to the ATV just to find that it ran out of fuel. We had to call his dad to pick us up in his truck, and we were luckily fine. I also learned from his dad a story that before the new house was built, an old cabin was there prior. Back in the 1950s, an old man lived there, and he was a lumberjack. He was a stereotypical, get-off-my-lawn old angry man. One day, some teens who lived in another house, now where one of my friend's cousins has a house, came to his property, and when the man yelled at them to go home, they mocked him. This led the man to grab his shotgun and shoot at them and wound one of the kids in the hand. He got put into jail, but was released. He then later disappeared out in the forest. Nobody knows where he went. He either got crushed by a tree he cut down or something much worse happened to him out there. My friend tells me stories all the time about things he sees out there. His own regular house back in the city is also haunted. It's a mansion built in 1909 and even myself has experienced many wild things there. Like figures and voices, also his whole family tells how they hear things falling over upstairs when alone sometimes. It's been about 10 years ago now, but I was a college professor at a local university in my area. This was a college for an accelerated program. People were generally in cohorts that took one to three years to complete. Generally classes met once a week for four hours. This specific class was during the winter months, so it was getting dark about the time this class started and it ended at 11 p.m. There had never been anything peculiar happening when I would leave and often I was the last one there because my class ended the latest. One night I had to stay and do grades for the end of the semester, and as I was walking to my car, I noticed a woman running towards me from the other side of the parking lot. I was already in my car by the time I noticed she was getting closer and closer to me, but I wasn't able to get the car started and drive away by the time she got to me. She closed the distance between us incredibly fast. She was yelling, but I couldn't understand what she was saying. She didn't have on much as it looked like she was wearing biker shorts that hit above the knee, a tight-fitting tank top, and flip-flops. It was an unseasonably warm January, but it still wasn't warm outside. I barely cracked the window so I could ask if she was okay. I would never have forgiven myself if I drove away, and she was actually in distress and needed help. She kept telling me that she needed a ride to the gas station. I was not letting her in my car. I told her I wasn't able to give her a ride. She then put her hand into the crack in the window, but it wasn't enough for her to get her whole hand in. I told her to leave and that I was driving off. 
She did stood in front of my car with her hands on the hood and was refusing to let me drive. I was genuinely concerned that maybe someone was after her, but I started to get very uncomfortable and got a very eerie feeling about this point in the interaction. She started telling me that she just needed cigarettes and didn't understand why I couldn't give her a ride. I told her I was unable to do that and that I was going to call the police and I was going to drive away. I'm not exactly sure how I maneuvered my car and I was able to reverse from where she was standing and then I was able to make a very fast U-turn and leave the parking lot. I did call the police department and reported this entire situation but I'm sure the woman was gone by the time the police arrived. Every now and then I find myself thinking back to this night and trying to understand what was actually happening. Was she trying to rob me? Was she actually in danger? It's like she came out of nowhere from the woods behind campus. It's always bothered me. I'm grateful that I'm safe, but it was just such a strange, unexpected interaction that left me very creeped out. I've got something pretty freaky. Last summer in Alaska, a buddy of mine was on a fly fishing trip. He is one of my good friends, very honest, big conservationist, and sort of innocent in his demeanor. He wouldn't hurt a fly. Just an all-around great guy. Anyway, he is camping in the backcountry as he is rafting his way down the river back to town. On his raft and camping with him were two girls and one other guy. So one night on this trip, they're camping and hanging out at the fire and pretty close to going to sleep. So they are working on putting the fire out. At this point, everyone at camp saw the silhouette of a stocky man and a dog. From what my friend says, this man starts mumbling at them and they can't tell what he's saying. He is about 20 feet away from my buddy and his campmates. My friend and the other guy go to confront him. He seemed like he was in a panic and my friend said there was definitely something wrong with him mentally. He starts talking about how he is a messenger from God and how he had the solution. No one knew what he was talking about. He ends up walking his way back to the campsite to the dismay of the group. The girls are obviously freaked out and scared and told my friend he needed to leave. Something about him just felt wrong and troublesome. My friend said his dog was nice but again, this stranger starts talking about how he is a disciple from God. Then he pulled out a gaming laptop and started showing my friend some code he wrote, but didn't pay too much attention to. He mentioned to me that the stranger isn't aggressive, just off-putting. It's worth noting, he only had a small backpack and no serious outdoor gear. He told my friend that he wanders the woods and occasionally heads into town. So eventually, they convince him to leave camp, telling the stranger they were going to bed. He agrees to leave. But three hours later, they hear something outside the tent that sounds like a man yelling yaho, and they come outside to find the campfire roaring again. The whole group stayed up the rest of the night with their bear spray and continued the camping trip downstream the next morning. Every time my friend has told me this story, he is visibly disturbed. My friend still wonders what he was doing out there with only a dog, no gear, and miles into the woods. My boyfriend and I frequently go camping together. The summer of 2016 was when this encounter took place. We had set up camp in a little site along a trucking road. It was about 40 minutes outside of a smaller town in the area and only had two campsites in this location. We chose the first site, which had a bit of a dirt hill to drive down, but the actual site was shaped into a circle. The other site was within view, but far enough away and surrounded by enough trees that you couldn't really see people in it, only tents and RVS. We noticed that the other site had an RV in it, but it's a relatively common spot and it was a weekend, so this was common. When the sun went down, we were sitting around the fire, probably around 11 p.m. when we hear some of TVS in the distance. This is a little weird because typically people ride them during the day, but not really concerning. However, then we see the headlights get closer and closer. Two of TVS drive into our sight, and at this point we're a little creeped out because it's pitch black 
were all alone and in a no service area. Two men get off the ATVS and walk towards us. I should mention that my boyfriend and I were 19 and 20 at the time, and these men are big. They come up and try holding just casual conversation, talking about how they're at the site beside us and wanted to introduce themselves. This is still a little concerning, as who introduces themselves this late at night. They continue to talk to us for probably 20 minutes before my boyfriend starts saying how we're running out of firewood and probably going to head to bed soon in an effort to get them to leave. They then start talking about how they'll bring their own firewood over and bring us some drinks. We try saying we're really tired, but they insist and leave the site. So my boyfriend and I quickly start trying to pack up the site and make it seem as though we really did go to bed. We did hear the ATVS later on that night passing by our site, but we didn't get out of our tent to check. Overall, it seems really mild, but it really freaked us out just being alone in the woods with these two bigger men. The whole situation was just really off. This incident occurred in Ozona, Texas in the summer of 2015. I had been on the phone with my ex-boyfriend, but I had fallen asleep. Then I suddenly woke up because I could hear my ex-boyfriend saying, baby, please don't do this. I believe that I had broken up with him while I was sleep talking to him. Anyway, he was telling me I was saying ugly things to him. In the middle of our conversation, I hear wings flapping and see a large shadow stop at my window. The first thing that runs through my mind is La Lechuza. I tell my ex not to hang up, but not to say anything. I'm scared, and I don't explain anything to him. Then all of a sudden the shadow disappears. I then start telling my ex what happened, when from the ceiling of my room I hear this horrible laugh and scratching. Then I try to yell and nothing comes out. I am frozen scared. I try to yell, I try to get up, but I can't. Somehow I finally jump off my bed and run across to where my cousin and her daughters are asleep. I try to wake up my cousin so I touch her and she opens her eyes. I said, there's a lechusa. But she didn't understand me. She said, what, pretty loud. The girls woke up and right then it's right above my cousin's room. The girls start to cry. I'm starting to freak the heck out. We don't know what to do. My cousin and I decided to call the cops and tell them that we saw someone looking in the window. I mean, what would they think if we said, we need an officer to rid us of this lechusa? Anyway, we call them and I swear the scratching, laughing and thuds are loud and getting louder. We wait and literally seconds before we see the spotlight from the cops outside, it stops. The cop arrives, but they soon leave. About 10 minutes after he leaves, it comes back. We run to the car and decide to leave. That was the last day I lived with my cousin. I was on my horse rounding up some lambs in the scrub at the edge of my dad's property. It's hot as hell, and it was a quick job so much have jumped in in thongs flip-flops for the non-Aussies and shorts. I am nearly done when I see one little bugger stuck in a fence, so I ride back to the edge and get down to get it out. As I got off the horse, I flicked up a stick and scratched my leg. I get the lamb out, it runs off to the others, and I go to get back on the horse. I feel a bit shit, but get on and ride back to the sheds where my dad was. I get there, jump off my horse, and look at my leg. Yep, two bloody marks where I got that stick. By this stage, I am feeling really shit and my leg is burning. I tell dad who thinks I am trying to get out of work, but says I better get to the hospital. We go in, I get swabbed, and it's a tiger snake bite. Get the anti-venom, spend a week in hospital and ages on crutches. And just to top it off, while I was in hospital, my boyfriend broke up with me. So recently, I was in my backyard garden in German and my cat and dog started running towards the fence. You could only hear sticks cracking. However, my pretty tough cat ran inside. You should know he's taking on dogs bigger than him. My dog did the same. But then I was able to get a better glimpse at that thing. 
It was a dog-sized creature without any traces of fur, black skin and kind of glowing orange eyes. Later that night I stood at my rooftop window and saw the creature running across the street in twilight. Last night I heard some pretty deep and creepy growls and howls out of the forest. I strongly believe it's some kind of cryptid, but I'm not sure. Do you guys know more about such a creature? So this event happened over the weekend while I was home from college for my mom's birthday. On Saturday night, I had a couple beers with my girlfriend who was spending the weekend at our house because my parents are super chill. At about 12.30 p.m., a few minutes after my parents went to bed, I went out to the back porch to grab a couple more beers for myself and my girlfriend who was waiting in the basement where we planned to watch Game of Thrones for a while before going to sleep. I opened the back door and stepped onto the back porch. Immediately the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end, and I felt like was being watched from the tree line my back porch overlooks the backyard which leads directly into a thick woods. I thought nothing of it at first because I always feels a little spooked going outside at night, but as I opened the cooler, I heard it. In my mind, it was unmistakable. The agonizing screams of what sounded like my next door neighbor and her teenage daughter, I won't say their names because Reddit creeps. What's even more terrifying is that I swear they were screaming a very specific thing. Sam, help us please Sam, my name. Now I was drunk and already on edge to frankly I turned around without the beers and locked the door behind me as I went back inside. Then I heard my mom's voice calling from upstairs, asking me if I'd heard it. I responded yes and asked if she knew what it was. She didn't have a clear answer, only speculation. But she knew for a fact that our neighbors were both inside their home. I'm not a hunter, but I was hiking in a state park with a friend once about a half mile away from the trail and five miles from the trail's start, and we found a woman's blouse, some jeans that were ripped from the zipper to the crotch, and a pair of underwear. It all looked super dirty, like it had been there for a really long time. It really freaked me out, especially because it wasn't the type of clothes you would wear for a couple mile hike. We reported it to the ranger station, and they said they would check it out, but I don't know if they ever did. When I got home, I looked for any crimes in that area for the past couple years, but I couldn't find anything. I haven't been in the woods without a group since. When I was about 19, I went duck hunting and flooded hardwood timber along the Wisconsin River. It was November at the time, and it was about 15 Fahrenheit 10 Celsius out. Most of the local lakes had frozen over, so ducks were thick along this section of the river. I had a 12-foot boat and a 10-horse motor, which was perfect for getting around between the tree trunks. But I parked the boat in the trees and set my decoys out in a little clearing. The water amongst the trees is about two feet deep, and it deepens to about three feet or so in the clearings. I'd finished setting up my decoys this morning at about 5 a.m. It was split pea soup foggy and leaves were being blown across the water. I was standing about thigh deep in the water on the edge of the trees. Now bear in mind that it's dark. My eyes were adjusted enough that I could see faint outlines, and that's about it. Suddenly, about 45 minutes before dawn, I noticed some large ripples in the water around my decoy spread. I got excited thinking that a duck I hadn't noticed had swum into my spread. However, the ripples started getting more agitated and suddenly started heading towards me very quickly. I started backing up as quickly as I could and trying to get my gun off my shoulder strap. I hit a log and sit down on it hard, almost going over backwards. The ripples suddenly turn into a splash and suddenly a huge ass otter has his front paws on my knees his face about three inches from my own. He hisses at me and I thought I was about to get mauled. After what felt like an eternity of him staring me down, he slips off me and circles the log a few times before joining what I could now see were four other otters about 20 feet away looking at this ordeal. After this fantastic occurrence, I sat on the log for about 20 minutes before pulling myself together and wading back to my hunting spot at the edge of the clearing. So 
Several years ago, during a chilling October evening, my friend and I embarked on a drive from Waldo to Cultus. The road was familiar to us, but as dusk settled in, the surrounding landscape transformed into an eerie and shadowy realm. As we maneuvered through the dwindling light, our headlights pierced the darkness, revealing an unexpected sight. A lone figure emerged from the gloom, trudging forward despite the biting cold. Clad only in a t-shirt and shorts, he seemed ill-prepared for the harsh elements that awaited him on his journey towards Cultus. Concerned for his well-being, we decided to stop and offer him a ride. Rolling down the window, I called out to him, asking if he needed assistance and if he wanted a lift to the nearby resort. To my surprise, his response sent a shiver down my spine. With an unsettling intensity in his eyes, the man looked at me and uttered a phrase that still echoes in my memory. You're going to take me to La Pine. His words were laced with an inexplicable demand, as if he expected nothing less than compliance. Caught off guard by his unwavering insistence, I attempted to reason with him, explaining that we were unable to accommodate his request to travel all the way to La Pine. I offered to drop him off at the resort, which was a more reasonable distance. However, his response was far from what I expected. In an alarming twist, the man swiftly produced a pocket knife, the glint of the blade reflecting the fading light. He repeated his demand with a chilling certainty. You're taking me to La Pine. The gravity of the situation suddenly became all too real, and the adrenaline surged through my veins. Maintaining a calm facade, I assessed the situation and made a quick decision. Sensing the potential danger, I chose to prioritize our safety and promptly drove away, leaving the mysterious man to his solitary trek in the desolate darkness. It was the year 2013 in Sangin, Afghanistan. Late at night, while on post, I had a thermal device attached to my RCO, allowing me to scan the southern green zone. Out of nowhere, a bright white blip materialized in the sky. It didn't appear to have flown in from any direction, but rather emerged within my thermal view. Intrigued, I paused my observation through the scope and noticed that the blip transformed into a hovering red light. Without hesitation, I radioed the Command Operations Center COC to inquire if we had any aircraft in the area. They confirmed that we didn't, and my comrade on post also witnessed the peculiar sight. Post 3 radioed in as well, validating that they too had visual contact with the object. The object started moving in an unconventional triangular pattern, intermittently pausing to hover before resuming its triangular routines. Suddenly, it accelerated, zooming away at an incredible speed, seemingly transitioning from a standstill to Mach 1 in an instant, and then it vanished. None of us could explain what we had just witnessed. Surprisingly, the object would reappear in different locations at random intervals throughout our deployment. Considering we had only about 100 personnel on the forward operating base FOB, news of the sighting spread rapidly. Many of the guys on post during the winter would catch glimpses of it as well. At times, we would even gather near the walls to catch another glimpse of this enigmatic phenomenon. It was an undeniably strange occurrence, and I found solace in the fact that others had also witnessed it. I was fishing near Vico, Italy, at the exact spot where I had witnessed an airborne disc on the 24th. Suddenly, a tall, thin man approached me, showing a keen interest in flying saucers. He even offered me a cigarette with a gold tip, but as soon as I smoked it, it made me sick, and he callously threw it into the water. After this strange encounter, he simply walked away. I began to fear that someone was trying to silence me, so I decided to take action. I went directly to the public prosecutor's office in the town of Luca and provided a detailed statement about my UFO experience, ensuring that it was documented and officially on record. Rustler Peak, towering at 6, 205 feet, held secrets that were waiting to be unraveled. It was in this realm, specifically in Section 10, 
that we stumbled upon a phenomenon that defied explanation twisted trees. Their contorted forms stood as silent witnesses to an unseen force that permeated the area, leaving us in awe of the mysteries that lay hidden within. But it was our most recent expedition that etched itself deep within our memories. We embarked on a thrilling mountain biking adventure, venturing north of Rustler Peak. The wind whispered through the trees, carrying with it an air of anticipation. Little did we know that the true essence of the unknown was lurking just around the corner. As we pedaled forward, a wave of putrid odor assaulted our senses, overpowering even the freshness of the mountain air. It was a stench unlike anything we had encountered before, a repugnant aroma that twisted our faces in disgust. The smell permeated the very essence of the landscape, seeping into our souls and leaving an indelible mark. Curiosity mingled with apprehension as we explored further, following the trail of this peculiar scent. It was not the smell of decay or death, but rather something altogether inexplicable. The intensity grew with each passing moment, casting a shadow of unease over our adventurous spirits. The landscape shifted before our eyes, the atmosphere thick with an otherworldly presence. We were no longer just mountain bikers traversing the terrain. We had become explorers of the unknown, unraveling the enigma that surrounded us. The scent guided our path, leading us deeper into the heart of mystery. With every pedal stroke, our hearts raced, a mixture of exhilaration and trepidation coursing through our veins. The unseen force that had twisted the trees seemed to manifest itself in this inexplicable odor, pulling us further into its enigmatic embrace. We were on the cusp of something extraordinary, standing at the precipice of understanding. But alas, the answers eluded us. The source of the odor remained concealed, teasing us with its presence yet refusing to reveal itself fully. We were left with a sense of awe and wonder, our minds buzzing with questions that would remain unanswered. Four years may have passed since that encounter, but the memories are as vivid as if they had happened yesterday. Rustler Peak, with its twisted trees and unexplained odors, continues to beckon to us a reminder that the world we inhabit is teeming with mysteries waiting to be discovered. As I reminisce about those moments, a spark of curiosity ignites within me, urging me to seek out new adventures, to delve deeper into the realms of the unknown. Rustler Peak has imprinted itself upon my soul, forever reminding me that there is more to this world than meets the eye, a tapestry of wonder and perplexity that begs to be explored. In 1981, an officer claims that he was on patrol with another officer. They received a call about something large in a wooded area of Sand Ridge State Forest. When they went to investigate, lo and behold, they saw what appeared to be a hair-covered man standing on two legs, watching them from about 200 feet away. The creature quickly ran off into the woods before either could get a good look at it, but both stated it looked like something out of this world. The following is an excerpt from the witness report about what happened. As we pulled up, it walked on two legs until reaching a tree, then knelt down behind it, rose up back on two legs, and continued staring at us. Officer Odia got out of the car, rifle in hand. I got out, putting my spare revolver in my waistband, pulling out my shotgun from its bracket under the dash. We both walked to the front of the cruiser, each taking a side, scanning for it. When Odia said loudly, there it is, I didn't see anything, so I shuddered where he told me where it was, behind a tree about 45 yards away, crouched down, watching us. He instructed me to stay back while he approached it for a better look. Odia stated that he watched as this thing kept looking left and right, making sure nobody else was coming. Once satisfied that they were alone, it began running back towards us. That's when I took my first shot at it with my 12 gauge. It was just beginning to rise up though, so all that happened was buckshot springing into the tree behind it. Odia then grabbed me, told me to follow him back to the car. Once we got back in the car, he told me we needed to leave now. It was very dark, but still light enough for us to see. This thing was hideous. Odia has since passed away. Before he died though, he wanted to come out and get the story. 
For all these years, I just never knew how or what the right time was. Most people have a hard time believing that policemen would not take into account shooting an unencrypted. However, when working with Odia, he claimed he would never shoot and kill a Bigfoot because they were simply too much paperwork. I live in Germany now, but the incident took place in southern Brazil, in the state of Paraná in 2021. A brief summary of how I ended up in this situation. In 2020, I discovered I had cancer, so I had surgery, chemo, etc. for a few months. I finished treatment in 2021, I was in the bath and felt something strange. The surgery site had ruptured after five months and was oozing pus and blood. I despaired. My father has a quarry with an open mine of about 120 meters in diameter and 20 meters deep. It is a place far from the city, about eight kilometers in the middle of the woods and with some family farms nearby. Well, I love the place and decided to go there to think about what to do. I was afraid to restart the treatment, afraid that maybe the cancer had come back with a vengeance. There is the place where the crushing plant used to be exactly where the trucks unloaded to the grinder. To take advantage of the force of gravity, it is located on the slope of a ravine about 30-40 meters high with an incredible view of the horizon. I parked my truck there and lay on top of it and watched the shooting stars. I don't know exactly how many hours later, but it should have been something like midnight. I hear footsteps slowly coming towards me. I was armed with a pistol, but I left it inside and I was in the back of the truck. All I had was a piece of wood lying there. At that time, I was scared of this being a criminal as we had problems with thieves stealing machine parts and parts. But this individual came right from the side of the cliff, and it was impossible for anyone to walk up. I even went back to check it later. My second thought was that it was a jaguar. Because I had been lying down for a long time, whether I was a jaguar or a criminal, it might have thought that I had fallen asleep. As the steps got closer, I deduced that it was already on my side. I looked without moving my head, and I didn't see anything that was the height of a person. So I jumped with the piece of wood and screamed because it had to be an animal. Then I saw something I'd never seen anything like it before, and I get goosebumps just writing about it. It was a human figure, completely dark brown. It had no eyes, no mouth, and no ears. It looked like thick smoke. It walked very clumsily as if twisting. When I jumped, it still hadn't finished climbing. I froze. It finished the climb. It passed by my side, about a meter away. When I jumped up and screamed, it did absolutely nothing. It passed by me and followed the opposite path. I took to get there, left the road, and entered the forest. I retrieved the gun from inside the truck. It walked for a while and came out again in the clearing. It started moving towards me. The night was very clear, with an almost full moon. When it got nearer as it came towards me, I started shooting. I shot 10 times. I remembered that I still had 12 rounds because when I arrived, I fired a few shots. I landed all the shots as it approached. It didn't do anything. It didn't seem to hit anything. At that distance, I never missed. Then it stopped and went back into the bush. The rest of the night it walked in a semicircle about 50 meters from me, into the woods, out on the clearing, and into the woods on the other side. When dawn came it entered the forest, and I could hear the footsteps in the distance. I grew up there, I know every inch of it. I'm 32 years old, my childhood and youth were spent walking around there, going into the forest. You've never seen anything like it. When I asked my father, he just said that it wasn't good to go there alone at night because there's something strange. He had come that early morning because they were looking for me since I had left without warning and left my cell phone at home. He figured I would be there. So I live in North Carolina, in the kind of suburb-ish of a kind of small town. I came outside to smoke and all the dogs started barking and then all at once stopped. I was watching my neighbor through the trees, bringing his dog in and a black mass moved very quickly through the trees. Now I'm in my backyard and it's fully fenced in and this thing looked like it was on my side of the fence. 
and it was fully black and almost round, like something hunched over, and it moved way too smoothly to be like a dog or deer. I'm just curious and mildly concerned lol, any ideas as to what this might have been? This encounter took place on Fort Carson, Colorado Gunnery Range in the fall of 1991. I grew up an Air Force brat who had been just about everywhere. I joined the U.S. Army out of high school, and I have my proud career to hang my hat on. That being said, it's taken me many, many years to have the guts to share this story. I have been haunted ever since. It still makes me shake to the core reliving that night. Our squadron was out in the field preparing for the qualification of the M1 tank and Bradley fighting vehicle crews. We called this gunnery downrange Fort Carson a scrub brush, which is an untouched landscape with a view of the Rocky Mountain Front Range that is simply beautiful. Towards the end of qualification, it is about 1.30 a.m. and the tank and Bradley crews were appearing to road march back to camp. The road back to camp was a well-groomed dirt road with very deep ditches on either side due to the heavy rainfall. Our team was back in the barracks awaiting the crews as we were to go to them if their vehicles had an issue or breakdowns. Nearly everyone in the barracks was laying on their cots either sleeping or playing bones by the stove as it was a chilly night. The head NCO was playing bones and listening to the radio traffic. He shouted out they were on their way back in. People start to stir and move around trying to wake up just in case they needed us. I was laying on the end of my cot with my feet on the floor. I had my beanie pulled down over my face to block the light. I was fully awake. The radio was directly across from me. Suddenly, over the radio, our co gave orders to start the road march back to camp. The radio crackled and conversations began to take place. The first crews to road march back out were the Bradley fighting vehicle teams. The first Bradley had a ground guide out front. Everyone was wearing night vision goggles, and they were using blackout lights to guide their way. Without warning, one of the drivers shouted, Hey, what the hell is that? I know the voice came over the radio. I don't know another voice. We need to stop. We need to stop. The CEO came over the radio and wanted to know what was going on up there. Another voice. Sir, we need to stop. Just then I recognized our EXO telling the CEO, we need to stop the convoy now, sir. Meanwhile, at the same time, everyone back in the barracks was now standing next to the radio and listening to what was going on and staring at each other with amazement. The CO gave the order to the lead Bradley to come to a full stop and halt the convoy. Keep in mind, while all this was taking place, the first and second Bradley crews were staring at a bipedal dark figure standing on the road looking over his shoulder at them at about 50 feet away. I mentioned the deep ditches. It was said by several crew members that this figure stepped out of the ditch with ease and began to walk in the middle of the road in front of the convoy. This bipedal creature had no care in the world that the crews or the vehicles were there. It's just standing there. By the time the CEO got to the front of the convoy to see what was going on, he had a hell of a mess on his hands. The radio chatter exploded into yells and F-bombs. People telling the ground guy to run and jump up on the top of the turret for safety. The EXO shouting to everyone over the radio to calm down and get their shit together. The first ground guide stated that in his night vision goggles, when this creature stepped out of the ditch and onto the road, the creature's eyes were glowing like green fire and standing before him. It was like having an out-of-body experience. The remaining crew had no idea what was going on up front. They could not really get a good look. But the first three Bradleys got to see everything. All the crews heard everything, and in the third Bradley was the EXO. He was a former state trooper, a solid no BS kind of guy who was standing through the turret hatch. He saw everything. As the CEO was making his way up the road to the front of the convoy, the creature turned and calmly walked to the other side of the road and disappeared into the ditch. The CEO was met by the EXO and the ground guide who told him what had happened. You could hear the conversation going back and forth through the ground guide's mic. Tensions were high. 
Soon the convoy was underway again. About 30 minutes later, the door burst open in our barracks and the crews started pouring in. They're excited and shouting at us. Did you hear what happened? The first ground guide was pushed to the front of the crowd and was asked to tell us what had happened in a military kind of way, if you know what I mean. Suddenly, the CEO came through the door. Someone yelled, attention. He made his way through the crowd to the center of the room and stated, you didn't see anything. None of this happened. And if I hear of any chatter about it tonight, you will answer to me. Do you understand? Everyone yelled, yes, sir. The next morning, we're all spent from the night before. No one got any sleep, and to make things worsen came the Black Hawks and men in suits with the base commander. They spoke to certain people, and the incident was soon put behind us. The most common thread amongst the eyewitnesses was that the Sasquatch seemed to not really care about the chaos on the road that night. It never ran or seemed to be scared. The way it stood there and stared at them, eyes glowing, is what freaked everyone out. I had always been a skeptic. Growing up, I scoffed at the idea of UFOs, laughed at ghost stories, and rolled my eyes at conspiracy theories. It was no surprise to anyone when I joined the police force, determined to bring some rationality to a world filled with wild tales and unexplained phenomena. My early days as a rookie cop were filled with mundane assignments, routine traffic stops, and the occasional domestic disturbance call. But everything changed when I received a call that would take me deep into the heart of the unknown. It was a crisp autumn morning when the call came in. I was stationed at the local police precinct, sipping on lukewarm coffee and trying to stay awake during yet another endless paperwork session. The voice on the other end of the radio belonged to Ranger Stevens, the head of a nearby national forest. He sounded anxious and out of breath as he relayed the message. We need assistance, he said, his voice trembling. We found something, something we can't explain. I exchanged bewildered glances with my fellow officers as I responded. We're on our way, Ranger Stevens. What's the situation? The answer was cryptic. Just get here as soon as you can. It's in the deep woods. We piled into a Jeep, myself and three other officers. The atmosphere in the vehicle was tense, our curiosity piqued by Ranger Stevens' unusual distress. We drove in silence, the dense forest canopy casting eerie shadows across the winding road. As we arrived at the designated spot, we spotted Ranger Stevens and two of his colleagues standing beside a massive black cadaver bag. The air was heavy with an unsettling stillness. I couldn't help but notice the bewildered expressions on their faces as they clutched the bag's handles. We approached cautiously, my heart pounding in my chest as I tried to prepare myself for whatever was inside that bag. Ranger Stevens, his face drained of color, finally spoke. We found this thing deep in the woods. It's not an animal. We don't know what it is. My fellow officers and I exchanged concerned glances before one of my colleagues, Officer Ramirez, asked, What do you mean, not an animal? What is it? Ranger Stevens hesitated for a moment, his voice barely above a whisper. It looks like, like Bigfoot, but it has the face of a werewolf and brown skin. We don't know how to explain it. The words hung in the air like a chilling fog. None of us knew how to react. It sounded like the ramblings of a lunatic or the plot of a B-grade horror movie. Before we could press for more answers, the sound of approaching rotor blades shattered the silence. A black helicopter descended from the sky, and the emblem of the CIA was unmistakable. Out stepped a group of operatives, dressed in all black tactical gear. One of them, a stern-faced man with a shaved head, approached us. Step aside, officers, he ordered his tone brooking no argument. We'll take it from here. We watched in a mix of awe and confusion as the CIA operatives carefully loaded the massive cadaver bag onto their chopper. The bag was secured with heavy chains, as though whatever was inside posed a significant threat. As the helicopter rose into the sky and disappeared among the treetops, I turned to my fellow officers. We were all stunned, 
Our disbelief and curiosity matched only by the profound uncertainty of what we had just witnessed. In the days and weeks that followed, the incident in the deep woods became a whispered legend among us. We never received any official explanation, and the CIA operatives had vanished as mysteriously as they had arrived. I found myself questioning everything I had once believed about the world, realizing that there were mysteries out there that defied explanation. I may have started my career as a skeptic, but that day in the National Forest had shown me that the world was a far stranger and more enigmatic place than I had ever imagined. And as I continued my work in the police force, I couldn't help but wonder what other secrets it might hold. About ten years ago, there was four of us walking through the woods local to us. To get to the best entrance to the woods, you have to walk through a crematorium. There was me, Thomas, Lisa, and Alice, and we had planned to go camping in the woods. We had been camping in these woods on many occasions. I had a very easygoing mum, so the parents of the other three would call my mum to ask if we was having a sleepover at my house. My mum been nice said yes. We were all 13 at the time. We was walking through the woods to where we normally camped, and on the way there we walked past a man with an axe. He didn't speak, just stared us out. We walked on and just brushed it off. The night went on as you would expect, having fun trying to drink and not be sick and just have a laugh with friends. We went in the tent to go to sleep about 3 a.m. About 20 minutes later, we heard what sounded like trees been axed down. The sound echoed around the woods and made us all alert. This went on for about five minutes, then as soon as it stated it finished. Thomas joked about the man with the axe and Alice got rather upset with him. Time had passed and just as we were about to go to sleep we heard footsteps. They were circling around our tent. We all sat up in shock and started to panic. We heard logs of wood been dropped outside our tent. We could feel the wood as it struck the floor. We gained the courage to look out of the tent and as well peered out. He was there sat on the floor staring into the tent as we opened it. We all bailed and ran as fast as we could from them woods. All this time we never heard him talk. Ten years on none of us have ever stepped foot near them woods again. This was probably six or seven years ago that this happened, but I do often think about it. So one day I was just having a little me time before work and felt like running inside this fast food place to sit down and have lunch. As I'm in line waiting to order an older man around 50s or 60s, I'm like 23 or 24 mind you walks up kinda close and starts chatting, asking me what my fave dessert was at that restaurant. I was being nice and said I liked the chocolate cake. Then he asks if I'm from around here, to which I just nodded and said yeah. He stated he lived way out in the woods, and I just nodded and kind of started to ignore him while it was my turn to order. I ordered my food and it came up quickly, so I took my tray to a table by a window. I had forgotten about the guy at this point and got up to get condiments and stuff. When I got back to my seat, I saw that he was at the table just in front of me facing towards me just staring at me with his food in front of him. I got a bad vibe and moved to the other side of my table so I wouldn't have to face him. I then realized I forgot to get something at the condiment area and got up to go over there. As I foolishly walked past the creepy man's table, he looked up at me and said, You don't have to sit alone, you know. I looked at him and said, I'm fine, I want to be alone, and continued to get what I was getting. When I walked back, I went around the other way so I didn't go past his table again. I ate quickly not even sure I finished because I was just weirded out. I could feel him just staring at the back of my head at this point, so I just got my tray and got up to throw it away and leave. As I walked past his table again had to walk past to get to the garbage cans he looked up and creepily smiled and said, hey well it was nice to meet ya, and I just threw a dirty look and walked quickly away. I left and kinda sprinted to my car to make sure he wasn't following me. I mean, maybe his intentions weren't bad, but I kept getting a weird vibe. I think about it often, like maybe he was genuinely looking for someone to chat with. 
I was just looking to eat and chill without being bothered, so maybe I could have been too rude. So there I was, stationed in Afghanistan during the years of 2011 and 2012. It was a tense time as we constantly monitored the predator feeds, eagerly anticipating the start of our shift and the missions that lay ahead. Little did I know that this particular day would bring forth a series of events that would leave us all in awe and disbelief. As we watched the feeds, our attention was immediately captured by the sight of a motorcycle speeding through the rugged Afghan terrain. It carried three individuals, one of whom had a bag over their head, facing backward. Instantly, a wave of concern washed over us, as we realized we were witnessing a kidnapping unfold right before our eyes. We braced ourselves, fearing the worst witnessing a fellow human being meet a tragic end. The motorcycle came to a halt near a cluster of trees, breaking the illusion of Afghanistan as a desert landscape perpetuated by the media. The captors led the hooded figure out of their sight, and he was forced to kneel on the ground. Time seemed to slow down as we anxiously awaited the next moments, filled with dread and helplessness. But to our astonishment, instead of carrying out a gruesome act, the captors unexpectedly lifted the hooded man back onto the bike. Confusion mingled with relief as we watched them speed towards the nearest town, our anticipation mounting. As they arrived in the heart of the town, our anxiety peaked once more. The motorcycle screeched to a halt, and the captors pushed the man against a wall. What could their intentions be? Our minds raced with speculation, fearing the worst. Then, something utterly unexpected unfolded before our eyes. A seemingly ordinary ice cream cart was pushed into view. The captors removed the hood, revealing the face of the kidnapped man. To our amazement, they handed him the ice cream cart, transforming him from a victim to an unexpected purveyor of frozen treats. As if scripted, the once captive man began moving through the town, selling ice cream to the locals. Confusion swept through our ranks, mirroring the disbelief we felt within ourselves. The situation had taken a surreal turn, leaving us questioning our assumptions and perceptions of the world around us. Lived in Germany for many years while my father was stationed there U.S. Army. We lived off base in private housing and I loved it. That country is amazing. The vast forests, the mountains, the countryside, the farmlands, the little towns. Everything. I quickly became really good friends with some local boys whose parents owned the town's dairy farm. We were always in the forests running around and exploring. Fishing, playing army, etc. I was around eight or nine years old around that time, 37 now. One night, stayed late at the farm hanging with the guys. Left about nine or ten-ish, it was dark, but then moonlight gave pretty good vision that night, I remember. I lived just across the soccer field and a small corn field from the farm. As I'm walking through the soccer field, I see a bit of movement, just real quick, from the corner of my eye along the tree line at the edge of the field. I quickly step up my pace. As I turn to take my usual path through the cornfield to my house, I see at least half a dozen silhouette figures emerge from each side of the rows of corn on the sides of the path. I froze so hard, they just stand there. Then there's one behind me. Before I can snap around and haul ass, he asked in German where I was going. I turn around now and what I see surprises, but relieves me also. I answered in English and told him I was heading home. He was then curious about my English. Turns out it was a team of special forces operators. I mean, these guys were decked out in so much tactical gear. I couldn't comprehend how they were able to move so stealthily. Night vision goggles, packs, bags, weapons, there was even a dog. They looked like total badasses who were using these small towns off base to do some training. I just happened upon them this particular night. I'll never understand why they chose to break cover and show themselves. They could have easily just stayed put, and I would have walked right by them non then wiser. They walked me home as it was on their way back, they said. Started off creepy for me, but it was actually pretty cool. An experience I will never forget that's always stuck with me. Cheers.
Most skinwalker sightings occur in the U.S., but I have heard a few allegedly true stories of similar shape shifting entities here in India. I have heard stories from my grandfather and my mother's grandfather about their encounters to be exact. Here I'll narrate my mother's grandpa's let's call him John story. It happened in the 50s, and in those days, the population of the area we live in was quite low. So adjacent villages were pretty far from each other. And the main mode of transport was horses. One evening after sunset, he was returning home on his horse on a very lonely road. There was nothing but farmland and trees on both sides as far as he could see. Suddenly in the distance he saw a large white lamb, baby goat-like animal just standing in the middle of the road facing him. There were a lot of jackals in the area so John took pity and decided to carry the lamb or goat home along with him. He approached it and picked it up and placed it on his horse such that the animal was in front of him on its side with its legs dangling across either side of the horse. It must have been half an hour after that when it was getting a little dark that John heard scratching noises coming from the below. He looked and saw that the legs of the animal had seemingly grown so long that they were literally rubbing across the road as they were moving. He got so scared that he just it threw across the road and quickly ran away on his horse. But that didn't end there. When he was close to his home but still not inside the village, he saw a disgusting-looking woman on the side of the road who started running alongside him. She was begging him to let him on the horse continuously. She ran away when human settlement came into view. John got high fever after the incident and was on his bed for a few days. He is now very old and himself told me this story. I think whatever he saw pretty much matches the qualities of a skinwalker. What do you guys think? When I was 24 years old, I drove all around the South End in Georgia, USA in a hearse. I was used to driving in the forest for miles on end with no contact with anyone else. The only comfort I had was the radio. I liked it even if it was mostly country rock and stupid love songs. It was around 11 p.m. and I was on this long stretch of road that I don't think anyone has been on for decades. By that point, I had been driving down this road for two hours and it looked like there was no sign I was anywhere close to reaching the end. Soon enough I had to take a leak so I stopped the car and hopped out. I was and I'm a big dude. I think I was around 190 pounds. I have lost a lot of weight since then but anyhow. I started peeing in the creek and when I was done I headed back for my car. But then I heard something. I darted my head back and saw this strange animal. It had red tentacles surrounding its mouth and this great big fangs with a strange green bubbly liquid oozing out. The rest of the body was mostly a dark yellow apart from the red dots on its back, seemingly in a random pattern. It had slimly skin like a frog and had the eyes of one too. It had a tadpole-like tail, but the strangest part were its legs. It only had two and I don't mean it had two legs and arms. No, it just had two legs with large claws on them, and the ankles were raised like a goat. But they had a large spike sticking out of them like a dew claw. It was making these awful heavy pig-like noises. It sounded like it just ran a marathon and the green ooze didn't help. I froze for a good three seconds and it did too. It had its legs spread like it was in a power stance. Once I snapped out of it, I bolted for my hearse and sped out of there. I didn't stay long enough at sea if it was chasing me or not. So that's my story. I know the idea of a two-legged creature doesn't make sense because all vertebrates are known for their four legs, and it couldn't have been an invertebrate, that's for sure. So please, if you have any idea on what I saw, please let me know. This all happened in 2016, if that helps. I was 12. Me and my father scouted the area several times. I had on first-generation electric socks and insulated coveralls. It was four in the morning on a heavily traveled deer path, and we both found great spots in the heavy snow, downwind of the path and concealed. I fell back asleep, my sock batteries died and my sweaty feet froze to my boots and my ass froze to the ground because I had a hot ass and it melted the snow which then refroze. A sound behind me woke me up and I turned around. A large doe's butt was about two feet from my face and I reacted by yelling shit. 
because I was an ill-behaved and heavily armed child. All I saw after that was a white tail popping up in my face and some pains to my torso. As you can tell, I'm still traumatized 50 years later. I don't deer hunt anymore. Whoa, finally got that off my chest. It was a cold evening in January 2023 in Navajo Summit, Arizona. I had my two nieces with me, one was six, the other eight. I had gone to our family cabin, waiting on my sister to return from town. The evening started at about 7 p.m., and we didn't have a key to the house. We waited for a couple hours, and the girls eventually fell asleep in my truck. As the night continued, the temperature also dropped. I fell asleep as well. I woke around 9.30 p.m. It was very cold in the truck. I started the vehicle. As I depressed the brake pedal to start the truck, I noticed in the side mirror a face looking at me from the glow in the tail light. I hesitated to look at first, but gathered enough courage to observe it again. I saw a white face with long gray-white hair and black eyes looking at me. I freaked out. Once I started the truck, I sped off and headed to the highway, not sure if what I saw was following us. It was. I continued down the highway in a panic. After a few minutes, I felt as if something had jumped into the bed of my truck. I turned west ahead towards a town called Ganado. I went as fast as I could to my parents' house. Upon reaching the turnoff, I felt it jump out of the truck and watched the same white-haired entity run along the right-of-way fence. As I pulled up to the house, I quickly carried my nieces inside. Once inside, I situated the girls for bed. Later that night, I dreamed that I walked about two miles to my aunt's house. No one was home. As I walked back home, I noticed this same white-haired thing paralleling me. I quickly ran home went inside and locked the door behind me, and then went to bed. As I woke the next morning, I noticed sand and dirt at the foot of my bed. I told my parents of what had happened and of what I had dreamed. Since we are native Navajo, they took me to a medicine man, and he told me that I actually sleepwalked to my aunt's house, and when I entered the house, it followed me in. Totally freaked me out. Did I encounter a skinwalker? The medicine man refused to answer my questions, but my father is still vigilant and believed that I was the target of a native witch. So I grew up in a small town in Canada. Just up from my house in the hillside, there was a shack. This shack was a bit bigger than an outhouse had a bed and a desk in it. Every full moon at about 2 a.m. you could see this figure standing overlooking my neighborhood followed by a dark ominous laugher and cries if this thing has been hurt deeply. What's strange is only the kids in the neighborhood could see it. It doesn't stop there though. We were all sitting in the hot tub at my neighbor's house and the house next to his was just getting built. So there was no fence between his house and the new house. We were all talking when my buddy saw something in the basement window he was facing the house. We all turn and at the same time we see an old man in the window and his smile grew to a huge size. We all saw it. Since then nothing has happened because we all moved and went separate ways. But now the hillside has been fully developed into housing. Do you think this was an evil entity or some soul suffering? When I was 11 years old, my father decided to treat us to a sledding adventure on a logging road not too far from our home. The location boasted higher elevation, guaranteeing better snow for our winter escapade. We gathered our excitement and set off to a place known as the Five Mile Cause, named after the steep hill it featured. As we arrived at our destination, I couldn't contain my enthusiasm. The left side of the hill was adorned with towering timber while the right side revealed a vast clear cut. At the bottom of the hill, a road emerged, stretching into the open expanse. My father, the ever-prepared adventurer, had even built a fire at the top of the hill to keep us warm as we indulged in the thrill of sledding. Eager to experience the rush, I decided to embark on a solo run down the hill. With adrenaline coursing through my veins, I slid down the slope, feeling the wind whip past me. 
Finally, I reached the bottom and gracefully came to a stop. Excitedly, I hopped off the sled and rose to my feet, ready to relish in the triumph of my speedy descent. But as I turned to my right, an unexpected sight froze me in my tracks. Two towering figures stood before me, their presence both mesmerizing and unsettling. These creatures, larger than any I had ever seen, locked their gaze upon me. In that moment, time seemed to stand still, and an inexplicable fear gripped my heart. Without a second thought, I pivoted on my heels and began walking away from the enigmatic beings. At first, my steps were cautious and deliberate, my eyes darting back to ensure I was not being pursued. But the growing sense of urgency urged me to quicken my pace. As my heart raced, I broke into a run, propelled by an instinctual need to distance myself from the unknown. About one o'clock in the morning, I stepped out on the front porch to put some dry food out for the cats, and evidently, I scared some type of creature because it was eating off the porch. And when I got out there and shut the door, it went down the bottom of the stairs to the driveway. It was small round. I didn't see any legs. I couldn't see its face. It didn't turn around. It had long brown hair that hung to the ground and it started to move. And it waddled as fast as it could, which wasn't very fast. It didn't have any legs and as it waddled, it kind of moved down the driveway. It started to grow, get taller and the brown hair was gone. It became short hair, dark hair. The legs grew as it went down the driveway. It wasn't making a sound. And I thought, as it's going down, I'm thinking raccoon. It gets to the end of the driveway and it's tall like a deer and I think deer. It runs across the street. It's not making a sound. It clears the sidewalk across the street with one foot. And at that point, I hear a hoof print. A hoof print. It ran across the lawn, the front lawn of the people up the street. They also have a concrete patio right after the lawn, and at that point, it made no noise as it went across the patio. At that point, I could see that it was growing long black hair, and it was running, and it was flowing up behind it. I watched it until it got all the way past all their lights. The street was well lit. I saw everything from the bottom of my porch to the end of the driveway. Hoof prints on the sidewalk cleared the lawn. No noise as it was going across their patio, and it started to grow long hair, black long hair that flowed out behind it. I don't know. I watched it until it went into the darkness. I had my porch light on. We have a street light out in front of the house. People across the street had their porch light on, which was unusual for one in the morning. We live in a cul-de-sac. The street is not very wide. At the end of the cul-de-sac, there's a field there, and there's a creek through their backyard and so it ran into the darkness. A couple of days later, I went over to the lady that lives in the cul-de-sac. I went in, sat down, and I told her all the things, and she sat there, stared out the window for a moment, and she said, well, I guess things happen. And she thought for another moment and said that she sees all kinds of animals coming up from the creek all the time. When I was 13 or 14, my mother's friend asked if I would like to babysit her kids for a few hours one night. I live in a rural town, and to get to their house, you have to drive to the outskirts of the town, about 15 minutes up a steep and narrow hill, surrounded by forest. Their house was just off the road. Now, if you pass their house, the road continues up into the mountains and forest, and eventually starts heading down the other side and onto a main road where you can turn right and head back to the town. This is a substantially longer route if you want to head back to town. Also pitch black as you're driving through woods. I was so exited and felt grown up to babysit. Mum's friend was lovely and her husband was a police officer. My dad dropped me off and Mum's friend was going to give me a lift home. I was there for a few hours, 11 p.m. or so, and all went well. When they returned, the mother said her husband police officer was going to drive me home. As we started off, he didn't turn right. Back down the road. The way we had come, he turned left, heading up the mountain and into the forest. I asked him, why are we going this way? He replied, it's just another way. Those were the only words he spoke to me. 
We sat in silence. He drove slowly deeper into the forest. When I said it was a longer route, I mean 45 minute drive instead of 15. I thought it was weird, but I was a naive and innocent kid. At one point I asked him if we were nearly there yet. No answer. I remember thinking maybe they had an argument as they were pretty cold with each other. When they got home, he did drop me off home safe and sound, and I thought nothing of it. Until I was an adult and the memory popped into my head one day. I don't understand why a grown man and a police officer would take that route with a young teen at 11.30 at night. I often wonder if he had sinister reasons. I didn't babysit again. Maybe I knew deep down it was weird. I never imagined that a secret meeting among government generals would thrust me into a living nightmare. I sat in a dimly lit, windowless room, surrounded by stern-faced men in uniform. Our top general, a man of steely resolve, paced before us, his voice commanding attention. Gentlemen, he began, we have captured one of the unknown creatures, but it has fled our laboratory. We must find it before it wreaks havoc. The hushed tension in the room was palpable as he continued to describe the creature we had inadvertently unleashed upon the world. Its description sent shivers down my spine. It had black fur that was very coarse looking, even for this time of year, the general explained. It was kind of like fur on a bear, but it stood up on two legs just like you and I do. The face was very wide, with eyes that were kind of glowing and pulsating white. It had very long arms, not quite as long as an ape's, but they hung right by its chest, and the hands only had three fingers, no thumbs that I could see. The fingers resembled more like claws. The room fell into an uneasy silence. The mere thought of such a creature roaming free in the world was a chilling prospect. The general's grim expression revealed the gravity of the situation. As the general continued to brief us on the urgency of the situation, I couldn't help but think of the innocent hikers and campers who frequented our national forests. They were oblivious to the lurking horror that had been unleashed upon them. Days turned into nights as we embarked on a relentless hunt for the escaped creature. Our search took us deep into the heart of the national forest where the creature had vanished. It was a place where the trees seemed to close in around us, casting eerie shadows in the moonlight. One fateful night, our pursuit took a sinister turn. We stumbled upon a grisly scene, the remains of an innocent hiker brutally mauled by the creature. Blood stained the forest floor, and our flashlights revealed a trail of destruction leading deeper into the wilderness. As we followed the gruesome path, the forest seemed to close in around us, and the atmosphere grew oppressive. Each rustle of leaves or snap of twigs sent shivers down our spines. We were no longer the hunters, we had become the hunted. Hours turned into days, and the relentless pursuit pushed us to the brink of exhaustion. Just when hope seemed lost, a stroke of luck led us to the creature's hiding place. A GPS signal provided the breakthrough we needed, and we closed in on its location. The final confrontation was a harrowing ordeal. The creature, cornered and desperate, unleashed its fury upon us. But we were prepared, armed with advanced technology and military precision. In the end, we captured the creature once more, ending the reign of terror it had unleashed upon the national forest. The death of the innocent hiker remained a secret, buried beneath layers of government cover-up. As I look back on that dreadful chapter of my life, I can't help but wonder how many more creatures like the one we captured might still be lurking in the shadows, waiting for their chance to escape. The horrors of that secret meeting continue to haunt my nightmares, a chilling reminder that the unknown can be far more terrifying than we ever dared to imagine. I'm not the type to believe in the supernatural, the occult, or even cryptids for that matter. But there's this one experience, an eerie encounter on the eve of Halloween that shook me to my core. I was young and invincible then, or so I believed, cruising down the rural roads of Illinois in my sleek sports car. It was a pitch black night, the kind that makes you feel like you're the only person left in the world, and I was relishing the solitude. 
Suddenly, out of nowhere, a black cat darted across the road. Its eyes, reflecting in my headlights, gave me just enough time to swerve, narrowly avoiding hitting it. The car spun out of control, the tires screeching against the asphalt, and came to a stop with the headlights facing a nearby field. And that's when I saw them. Dozens of people, all donned in black robes, standing amidst the tall grass. Their eyes, wide with surprise, reflected in my high beams. The sight was so surreal, so out of place, it took me a moment to fully comprehend what I was seeing. Before I could react, they scattered. Like shadows fleeing from the light, they dissolved into the darkness. But a few, their faces hidden beneath their robes, started charging towards my car. Fear gripped me, adrenaline surging through my veins. I could hear my heart pounding in my ears, and without thinking, I slammed on the accelerator, peeling out of there as fast as I could. The sight of the robed figures, their forms shrinking in my rearview mirror, is something I'll never forget. Now, this was back in the late 90s, before the Harry Potter frenzy took over. So, it's safe to say it wasn't some fan gathering. I don't know what they were doing out there in the middle of nowhere, in the dead of night. But it felt like I had stumbled upon something I wasn't supposed to see. Now to the part that still gives me chills to this day. In the split second before I hit the gas, I saw something else in that field. At the edge of my high beams, there was a figure, far taller than any of the robed people, hunched over and covered in hair. It stood on two legs and its eyes, glowing in the darkness, met mine. I've heard tales of cryptids, stories told to scare kids or thrill seekers, but in that moment, I couldn't deny what I was seeing. It was something unknown, something out of place in the world as I knew it. I didn't stick around to find out what it was. I just drove, leaving the field, the robed people, and the cryptid far behind. Since I can remember, I've always had a deep love for nature, you could say it's my passion. That's why a job as a park ranger felt like a perfect fit. I remember one particular job at a nature park that operated from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. Our shifts were always rotating one week, I'd be on the early shift, and the next, I'd be closing up for the night. One Friday evening, I found myself on the closing shift. I had led a brief tour for some visitors that day, but other than that, my day was relatively quiet. Since there wasn't much to do, I decided to start my evening walk through early. It was already getting dark, and I was making my way through the woods when I noticed a strange light flashing against the trees behind me. Curious, I went to check out the source of the light. But as I got closer, the light flashed again, this time from the direction I had just come from. I yelled out, telling whoever was messing with me to stop it. Then, the light flashed again from a completely different direction, too far for a single person to have moved in such a short time. I figured it must have been two people messing with me, maybe some co-workers, although we weren't particularly close and we didn't typically play such pranks. I yelled again, stating I wasn't in the mood for jokes and that whoever was responsible should leave. Realizing I had no control over this situation, I informed my supervisor that someone might still be in the park and that it wasn't my problem anymore. He told me he'd take over, so I left, got in my car, and began the ten-minute drive home. Suddenly, my phone rang. It was an unknown number. I answered it, and a raspy voice on the other end told me I shouldn't have left them there alone, that I would regret it. I warned them never to call me again and hung up. When I returned to work the next day, I was informed that they'd found a dead dog at the spot where I had seen the flashing lights. The realization hit me like a cold wave. This was the work of a seriously disturbed individual, someone who would commit such a horrific act just to mess with me. My friend and I used to go ghost hunting when we were in middle school. It consisted of me asking questions directed towards spirits and ghosts. This is pre-smartphone days. We also brought a handheld voice recorder that was pretty expensive. It was his dad's who was into music and playing instruments. We brought the recorder because we knew it was more likely we would get an EVP than an interaction we were aware of. 
EVP electronic voice phenomenon is when you record a noise or voice of a spirit, paranormal entity on your device. When you play the recording, you hear the ib which you did not hear with your own ears because the frequency was too high. I have had several interactions, but I'll talk about two right now. The first I actually heard, and it was terrifying. It was an especially creepy night at the location we were at which we frequented for these interactions. So creepy as took us 15-20 minutes to walk 20 feet. Other nights we would freely walk around and not be creeped out because we didn't feel like there was another presence. Well, this night there was something there, and after I asked a question something in front of me, about 10 feet away swiftly glided towards me while gargling a low og, which got progressively louder and more aggressive as it came towards me. The noise came all the way right up to me before I could start to run away. It moved really fast, but I could see absolutely nothing in front of me. There was no body there. My friend and I bolted and ran all the way home. We listened to the recorder the next morning since we were too afraid to play it that night. And it was exactly like I describe it now. The other experience. This was an app. We were listening to a recording at his house that we had just recorded. On the recording I was casually talking to him about something when all of a sudden there is a blood-curdling female scream. On the recorder, it was way louder than my voice and long and drawn out as if a woman had just been stabbed or seen some horrific shit. It was the most chilling scream I have ever heard, and I did not hear it at all when I was at that creepy location having the conversation with my friend. On the recording device, when the scream happens, I am mid-sentence, and I do not pause or react. Neither of us do. I remember that night, and we heard no scream. I've had some other experiences that are just as scary, seen an actual apparition, seen poltergeist, had my girlfriend physically hit and pushed on more than one occasion, and I've had some other evas. My story goes back to 1975. My girlfriend and I were driving back to Idaho where I was going to school. We were headed towards Yellowstone Park and the Montana East Gate in a little yellow Volkswagen. It was around midnight and it was kind of snowing and picture a two-lane road with tall trees and no moon or nothing, just our headlights and the snow is falling. All of a sudden there was this figure I saw walking right in the center of the road, walking the same direction as me. In other words, her back was to me. It was a woman. At first I noticed her and I told my girlfriend, do you see what I see? A girl walking out here at midnight. It's probably about 30 degrees out. The closer we got, the more detail I could make out. It was so. I was gonna roll down my window and ask if she needed help. But we noticed that she was wearing very, very old, I guess 19th century garb clothing. And she had hobnail boots. She had a long shawl and around her shoulders and in her hair, she had long brown hair, down probably a little bit below her shoulder blades. And the closer we got, we noticed something weird. Her hair was completely dry, not wet like you would expect for somebody out in snow. I was about to roll down my window and my girlfriend goes, don't even stop, don't even look, go. You know, that freaked me out because I was just about ready to slow down. She said, don't even look in the mirror. She has no face. I drove away. You can imagine, here we are putting along in a little Volkswagen, and I just slowly moved over to the right to avoid hitting her. As I moved off and later got to the gate, the ranger said, sorry, the pass is closed tonight due to the snow. I asked, you mean we gotta go back? He says, well, there's a little motel about a half a mile back. We were scared out of our wits. Anyway, we got to this motel and fortunately the guy still had a room available. And as soon as we got in the room, we just locked the door and put the chair in front of it. The rest of the night we couldn't sleep. Using a throwaway in the off chance someone I know sees this. To give some parameters, I'm a 20-year-old guy in Tennessee. I've always been into cryptids, supernatural oddities, and basically everything mysterious or unexpected. However, I haven't had the time lately to research too much on which cryptids are which. Basically, a couple years ago, I started seeing weird deer. 
I couldn't explain why they were odd, they just didn't seem right. One day I ended up seeing a rather large buck that had that aura about him, and I shit you not he looked dead at me and stood right up on his rear legs. Needless to say, I bolted before he could start walking towards me. It continued I ended up catching a couple of these encounters on camera, one of a deer levitating, and another of one standing and walking all on my trail cams. Other creepy things started happening like hearing mimic sounds and the voice of my brother coming from the woods when he was standing next to me. I thought it was just something weird on this spooky chunk of land I lived on. I moved about an hour away from there a few months back, and nothing too crazy has happened since. That was until tonight when me and my girlfriend were laying in bed. We didn't get to bed until about 2.30 a.m. and around 3.13 we heard a weird noise through the open window above our bed. It's the goddamn mimicking again. Something is out there making very obvious fake dog noises. I almost went out to check and see if they were okay before my groggy ass remembered all the dogs were obviously brought in for bed over an hour ago. I know it sounds crazy, but I'm pretty sure whatever this is has followed me before, and it followed me again, maybe. What cryptid or thing has these traits in the middle, upper Tennessee region? Any comments or help would be greatly appreciated. It's 4.30 now and I'm laying in bed reading random books online and Reddit threads trying to learn what this is and how to deal with it. I used to hunt to fit in with the family many years ago. Didn't care for it. Wasn't good at it. Went and did it anyways. One of my first kills was a fawn. It was awful. I didn't mean to shoot a fawn. There was a whole herd of whitetail scattered around a field that we stumbled upon. The bastard donor I was with wasn't into hunting properly, so we came upon them driving at dusk, and he demanded I hop out of the vehicle and shoot at them from the truck door. I shot at the first brown thing that came into my sights. He was standing half behind a hilltop, and I thought I'd shot at the doe. I was wrong, and let me tell you, there is nothing like watching an entire herd of white tail scatter, except for one lone doe who stays behind, standing there and calling loudly for her baby. I'll never forget how horrible it was. She didn't leave when we started approaching the fawn either. I got the gut-wrenching experience of watching her baby try to get up and run to her but be entirely unable to because her front end was mangled while she cried out for it more and more frantically. Eventually she ran when we got too close, but she didn't go far. She stayed at the tree line while the bastard donor fired round after round point blank into the fawn's neck, missing each time and putting the animal in more and more distress. He was breaking its back, he said. He didn't. Eventually it just bled out. I don't know when the doe left. She was gone when the fawn died. I was never able to go out into the fields after that. I'd questioned the family's hunting abilities for years at that point. I'd had concerns about their practices before, but seeing firsthand how ruthless, dangerous, and cruel so-called experienced hunters could be and being thrown into the situation of being a danger myself left me terrified of being in the trees fields with someone like that ever again. I'm still a massive supporter of safe, legal hunting, and I completely understand the appeal of it as both a sport and a lifestyle a freezer full of meat saves a lot of money. I'm thrilled when friends score a big hunt. I love seeing records set. But I'm also a huge advocate against any sort of poaching, improper gun use, and immoral hunting. People need to be educated about what they're doing and how. They need to understand the gravity that is killing another living thing. Yes, hunting can be thrilling, beneficial, and a great experience. But it's not like hockey or soccer or any other sport. It's dangerous and deadly. It's grim and disgusting. You either do it right, or you don't do it at all. I don't care how much fun you're having. You're involved in an activity with a lot of responsibilities, and if you can't fulfill that, you have no right to kill another living being. Couple that with how many people have died out where I live due to completely preventable hunting accidents because so many people are like the bastard donor and worse, and you couldn't pay me enough to go back out there again.
Back in 1995, my ex and I were driving from Langlea, FB, Virginia to Columbus, Ohio. We were on 33 between Harrisonburg, Virginia and Elkins, West Virginia. Very Appalachia, if you know what I mean. To our right, just off the highway and in the forest, there was something very large and gray moving parallel to us. We only saw it for a moment as I was probably doing 80 miles per hour. We didn't get a good look at it because it was obscured by the trees and I was speeding. It looked like the side of an elephant, no head, just this big, gray body walking. I said to my ex-wife, did you see that? She replied, WTF was that? We were both shocked. We later joked it was Baby the Dinosaur because we were kids from the 80s. I've seen strange things before and since, but nothing tops that. I haven't thought about it in probably 10 years, but was talking to my wife and son this morning about weird things, and it came up. I googled West Virginia cryptids and found the Grafton monster. My memory is fuzzy, but this is close to what I saw. That's it. That's the tale. Just wanted to share. The allure of the forbidden always held a peculiar fascination for me. When I embarked on a solo hiking trip deep into the heart of the vast national forest, I couldn't resist the temptation to explore the uncharted territory that locals had long warned me about. This area, hidden from the prying eyes of tourists and authorities, was rumored to be cursed, a place where ancient legends whispered secrets of unspeakable horrors. As I ventured further from the well-trodden paths, the forest became denser and more foreboding. The gnarled branches of ancient trees seemed to claw at the sky, casting eerie shadows that danced like malevolent spirits. The oppressive silence pressed in around me, broken only by the occasional rustle of leaves or the distant hoot of an owl. The trees began to thin, revealing a desolate clearing in the heart of the forest. Here, the sunlight struggled to penetrate the canopy, casting a feeble glow that only served to enhance the eerie ambience. Amidst the tall, moss-covered rocks, I spotted an enormous boulder that beckoned me closer. It was beneath this colossal stone that I stumbled upon something that defied reason, a nightmarish tableau that would haunt my dreams for years to come. There, nestled beneath the rock's imposing shadow, lay the desiccated remains of a creature that could only be described as colossal. The partially buried corpse was massive, with elongated limbs that stretched outwards as if in defiance of death itself. The skeletal structure was unlike anything I had ever encountered, bearing no resemblance to the fauna of our modern world. The bones were aged and yellowed with time, hinting at an existence that spanned millennia. My heart pounded in my chest as I dared to get closer, my trembling hands reaching out to touch the ancient remains. But as I examined the creature more closely, an unthinkable terror gripped me with icy fingers the colossal carcass had moved. Panic seized my senses as the bones shifted and creaked, sinews and tendons that should have long turned to dust strained and flexed. The ancient giant, or whatever abomination it was, stirred beneath the weight of time. In that horrifying moment, the very laws of nature seemed to unravel. Without a second thought, I turned and fled, my footsteps echoing through the chilling silence. The dense forest closed in around me like a suffocating shroud, and my heart pounded a desperate rhythm in my chest. Fear and disbelief warred within me as I pushed myself to run faster and farther. Finally, I burst out of the forbidding part of the forest, back into the relative safety of the more familiar trails. Gasping for breath, I collapsed onto a mossy knoll, my mind reeling with the magnitude of what I had witnessed. What had I stumbled upon in that forbidden clearing? Was it an ancient giant, a Nephilim, or something even more nightmarish? Questions swirled through my thoughts, and I couldn't help but wonder if the legends and whispers of the cursed forest held more truth than anyone could have ever imagined. What did I just witness, and what unspeakable horrors lay hidden beneath the ancient trees of the National Forest? In April 2011, a friend and I were stargazing on my roof on a dry, clear night in New Jersey. We were observing the Lyrids meteor shower that wasn't producing as many shooting stars as we had hoped. 
but we stayed up there, intensely focused on the sky to see one every few minutes. After a couple hours of this, we caught a bright light in our peripherals. We turn around and see what looks like a bright blue-white LED flashlight traveling in the forest behind the house. At first instinct, we thought it was the police with a flashlight chasing someone. But then we realized that the light was up in the treetops, weaving through the canopy. All we could say is, WTF, is that over and over again as it got closer to us. It was traveling along the direction of the river behind our house and seemed to notice us because as it passed the back of my house, it slowed to a gentle stop, then took a 90-degree turn onto the clearing of our property about 40 feet from us coming straight towards us, as if it had noticed us and wanted to check us out. This is when we got our first really good look at it. It was a perfectly defined glowing sphere of light, the size of a basketball with what seemed like churning flowing plasma inside. Icy blue-white hue emitting absolutely no sound at all. We started screaming at this point. As it approached, it moved very slowly compared to the pace it had traveling through the trees. It seemed almost cautious in its movement. It's weird, but you could sense some form of intention intelligence in its movement. We were horrified because we knew nothing could explain what we were seeing, and we weren't about to F around and find out by letting it get any closer. We scrambled off the roof and ran inside, hiding under a blanket like scared little children, even though we were in our late teens. We didn't talk about it much after that because we just couldn't explain it. About a year later, one of my neighbors is banging on my door telling me to let him in. He told me that him and a friend were down by the river in that same patch of woods and were chased by a floating silent light ball. This freaked me out because I knew he was telling the truth. I had never told him the story of my encounter. I'm a trucker by the name of Jack. I've driven through many a desolate stretch of road, passing by endless miles of nothingness. The solitude doesn't bother me. In fact, I kind of like it. But there's this one memory, this one particular drive through the middle of nowhere Colorado that still sends a chill down my spine. There wasn't much around. Just barren landscapes, the open road stretching out in front of me, and my truck humming along to the rhythm of the highway. It was the only road visible on my map, and it was almost eerily devoid of human touch. But then, up ahead in the horizon, probably about a half mile away from the road, I spotted an unusual cluster of houses or buildings. In a place so desolate, so untouched by civilization, the sight of these structures seemed utterly out of place. Intrigued, I kept my eyes on them as I approached, curiosity piqued by the incongruity of it all. As I drove past, I got a clearer view. The houses were set up in a circle, forming a sort of perimeter around an open area. What was more unsettling, though, were the people I saw walking around in the center. They were all donned in black robes, their faces hidden from view, gathering in a tight circle. Then, out of nowhere, three black SUVs appeared. They drove across the barren landscape, plumes of dust rising in their wake heading directly towards the group. A sense of unease crept over me, a cold shiver snaking down my spine as I watched the scene unfold. Something about it felt wrong, like I was inadvertently witnessing something I shouldn't. I remember wishing I had the time to stick around, to see what was really going on. But duty called. I had a schedule to keep, deliveries to make. So I kept driving, leaving the strange sight behind me. In the rearview mirror, the sight of the robed figures and black SUVs slowly faded into the vast Colorado landscape. I often find myself mulling over that sight, wondering what was happening back there. It seemed like something out of a cult movie, a secret meeting in the middle of nowhere. But I guess I'll never know for sure. All I have is this unsettling memory and a story that sounds too strange to be true. I've seen many odd things during my years on the road. But that eerie sight in Colorado remains the most inexplicable of them all. There's something about driving at night that strips the world of its normalcy, turns the mundane into the mysterious. I learned this the hard way during a run from Yuma, Arizona, 
driving the lonely stretch where the I-8 intersects the 85 at Gila Bend. It was a familiar route for me. I'd made countless runs along that road, so much so that I even had a regular spot where I'd pull over to stretch my legs and take a leak. That night was no different, or at least that's what I thought as I rounded a bend, the spot in question just up ahead. As I was about to pull over, my headlights illuminated a figure strolling across the highway. It was a creature unlike anything I'd seen before, a strange amalgamation of features that didn't belong together. It looked canine, but its appearance was grotesquely warped. Its hind legs were elongated, almost rabbit-like, but twisted in a way that didn't seem natural. Its body was lean and muscular, its defined muscles rippling under the skin as it moved. Its snout was long and narrow like that of a wolf, but devoid of any fur. The creature's skin was an unusual sight, a stark contrast to the mangy patches you'd expect on a hairless animal. Instead, it was thick and tough-looking, almost akin to a rhino's, but it had an uncanny smoothness to it that caught the reflection of my headlights. But what really got me, what truly sent a shiver down my spine, was the way it regarded me. As I slowed down, it didn't panic or run away as you'd expect a wild animal to. It simply continued its leisurely stroll, its eyes never leaving me. It was as if it was sizing me up, unafraid and eerily calm. The creature was massive, easily the size of a Great Dane or a Cane Corso, and its bizarre, uncanny appearance left an indelible mark on my memory. I watched, paralyzed, as it disappeared into the darkness on the other side of the road. Needless to say, I didn't stop that night, nor any other night after that. My usual pit stop was permanently tainted by that eerie encounter. Now, every time I make that run, I can't help but scan the roadside, half expecting to see that creature again. And each time, a chill runs down my spine, a reminder of the night when the mundane turned into the mysterious. I have stories about both my farm and my boyfriend's farm that might be interesting to you. Farms have a lot of history. My family has been farming in the exact same spot since the 20 new 70 as when my family arrived from Germany, and his family has been farming in the same area since the 1930s. Therefore, they have lots of tales. My boyfriend's dad, I'll call him my father-in-law, because he basically, as I swear, has seen everything at least once and has the most interesting stories. I will share a couple of his to start. For context, my boyfriend's family farms on both sides of Iowa and Missouri border, since they live fairly close to the state line. They have corn, soybeans, and beef cattle on pasture. I particularly love the cattle, because I love getting to jump in the ranger and ride around the pasture with my boyfriend to check on the cows. We do this almost every night in the spring, summer, and fall to make sure they are healthy, not injured, account for the calves, make sure they have enough grass, and look to see if there are any holes or breaks in the fences. In the wintertime, they get moved to a lot with a covered shed to protect them from the elements, so they are not on the pasture, and we feed them hay. Anyway, in the mid-2000s, my father-in-law was out in the wooded area of the cattle pasture. The trees are quite dense here, and it often serves as a great deer hunting spot in the late fall winter once the cows have been moved to the winter lot. He was setting up trail cameras in the woods to watch deer in preparation for hunting season that fall. After some time, he came back out to get the card out of the camera to see if there were any big bucks roaming around. When he took a look at some of the pictures, he saw that there had been an unusual man back there. Trespassers aren't all that uncommon and often it's just an annoyance rather than cause for concern. There was no way to tell who it was, so he just forgot about it. A few days later, he went back to hang the camera back up in the tree. When my father-in-law went back a second time about a week later to get the camera to see the pictures, someone had dug three makeshift graves in the back corner of the pasture. At the head of each grave was a wooden cross with the first name on it. He unfortunately didn't catch the man on trail camera, but he alerted the police about the situation. I think based on the names on the crosses, the police had an idea of who it could have been. The rural Midwest is smaller than you think for being so vast. 
My father-in-law wasn't really sure what came of that and never asked too much into it. But if he hadn't discovered those graves in the pasture and alerted the police, they might have been filled. For the second story, my father-in-law had some farms in Missouri that were bordered by the Missouri River. The Missouri River flows down through the Dakotas, along the Iowa-Nebraska border, and then at Kansas City it takes a turn and divides the state of Missouri in two until it reaches the Mississippi. One spring in the late 1990s, he was out in a field next to the Missouri River planting corn. This was before all the current high-tech tools that farmers have at their disposal, now which can tell you if you have an issue with your machine right from the cab. He thought that his planter was having some issues, so he jumped out to check if something was broken. When he got out of his tractor, he noticed a really strange smell. A bad smell. If you know anything about farming, planting season is fast-paced time to try to beat the weather and he was more concerned about getting his crop planted than investigating. He just assumed it was a dead deer washed up in the river and continued on until he though the planter was having problems again a few hours later. This time, he was on the end of the field closer to the river. The smell was stronger and unlike anything he had experienced before. They continued on that day working until one of the hired men asked if anyone noticed the bizarre smell coming from the river. My father-in-law said he had, and wondered to them if it was a dead deer, but usually deer didn't stink quite like this. One of the hired men wandered across the field to the edge of the river. It's not like a nice sandy beach that touches the ground to make a shoreline. Often it is a rocky or steep overlook many feet down to the river below to get a closer look. At the bottom, he saw what he thought was animal tangled in the branches washed up by the river. Looking closer, he realized it was a person. They immediately called the police. Turns out, it was a missing woman who was a known prostitute from Kansas City who had made it this far downstream. I cannot find the exact article or name, and I don't know if the police ever told my father-in-law her name even though they briefly questioned him. But I do know there are a few articles of women being found in the river east of KC in the late 1990s. My dad saw the Michigan Dog Man back in the 70s or 80s in the northern part of Michigan. I remember the first time he told me. I had never heard of it, but was just starting to get into the paranormal, cryptid universe and I was shook. He said him and a few buddies were driving up North Michigan to their other buddy's house to go hunting. When they pulled over to take a quick bathroom break, if anyone knows Northern Michigan, you know how dense the forest can be. They all got out and as they were doing their business, one of them started howling as a joke. Then they heard something howl back at them, very close. It happened again, and they all jumped in the car as fast as they could. As they were pulling back on the road, my dad said a dog-like creature wearing a tattered soldier uniform came from behind the brush and stood there. He said he couldn't believe what he was seeing, and it was as if time stood still for a few minutes. They continued driving away as fast as they could, which caused them to take a wrong turn and got lost. My dad said they had to sleep in the car that night so they could find their way back to their friend's house in daylight. I know my dad wouldn't make up the story. He said a few years later a bunch of sightings started coming out of the woodwork in northern Michigan as well. There's even a song about it. I'm curious, has anyone seen a dog man or any other cryptids in Michigan? Ever since I was a kid, I remember my grandma denouncing horror of any kind ghoulish Halloween masks, haunted houses, scary movies. I had attributed this aversion to her background and faith. She is Hispanic and a devout Catholic. She believes anything horror related is wrong, evil, you name it. So imagine my shock and curiosity when my grandparents shared a bombshell. Back in 1974, my grandpa convinced my grandma to see the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This would be her first and last scary movie. The weekend after the movie, my grandpa, grandma, my then toddler age mother and my aunts and uncles decide that they will go horseback riding for the first time. Since everyone lived in Wisconsin, my family made the journey to a farm about two hours away. For the most part, 
Everyone is in high spirits. Who can say no to a family adventure on a crisp autumn Wisconsin day? Despite the other's excitement, my grandma is worried. Since she doesn't care for horses, she chooses to stay behind on her own with my mother. When my family arrives at the farm, it is three o'clock. According to my grandma, she watched everyone get saddled up and then slowly ride off into the tangle of trees. The guide leading my family called out that the ride would last less than two hours, mentioning different trails, the need for breaks, things of that nature. My grandma figures everyone will be back by five o'clock. She waits with my mother in the car, playing games, reading storybooks, and trying to silence her bubbling anxiety. Needless to say, five o'clock comes and goes. No sign of my family. By this time, my mother has fallen asleep, which leaves my grandma with no way to distract herself from her worries. Finally, when six o'clock rolls around, she calls to a farmhand from her car window. No way is she leaving the safety of her vehicle. She demands to know why her family hasn't returned yet when five o'clock has long since passed. By now, darkness has begun bleeding into the Wisconsin sky. The farmhand assures her that everything is okay and that extra paths are taken throughout the ride. He tells her that her family should return soon. Now keep in mind, this was well before cell phones were a thing. Also, a week before, she had seen her first scary movie, and it had scared the shit out of her. At this point, my poor grandma feels like she's living out a scene from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. She tries to contain her worry and begins a hushed, fearful prayer. Until the flash of lightning that is soon followed by ear-splitting thunder. The noise wakes my mother, who starts to cry. My grandma must now not only ponder the frightening question of where her family went, but she also has a stressed, howling two-year-old to deal with. It is now reaching seven o'clock. The storm is growing more ferocious by the second. My grandma has to pee and her bladder feels like it's going to explode. But between the roar of the storm and the images of crazed country maniacs plaguing her mind, she refuses to leave the vehicle. She plans in her head that if they aren't back by 7.30, she's going to leave and find the nearest gas station to phone for help. Again, no cell phones during these days. 7.30 comes. Her family hasn't come out from the woods. As she's scrambling around the car for the keys, she realizes my grandpa never gave them to her. The pound of a fist against her window shakes her from her whirlwind of panic. That panic amplifies by a million when she notices a sizable, brawny man peering in at her. He is wearing a jacket and the hood covers his head. My grandma says that by now, it felt like someone had pushed a button and sent the world into slow motion. Everything crawled by at a snail's pace. Why don't you and the little one come inside? The man yells. His words are authoritative and carry no hint of warmth. He isn't speaking from a place of concern. He's ordering my grandma into the farmhouse. All my grandma can do is shout, where is my family? The man responds gruffly, we're looking for them. My grandma orders him to call the police. The next words the man said made my grandma literally piss her pants. We don't need the police. As he turns to go back into his house, he says, you and the baby can come inside whenever you are ready. My grandma starts to sob, wholly convinced that her family has been brutally murdered and that she and her baby will be next. In the chaos of this moment, she hears someone calling her name. But because of the pitch black darkness and her profound fear, she knows she must be hearing things. Then she hears her name again, this time even louder. Dora, help me. It's my grandpa's voice. When she realizes this, she puts my mom in the back seat, grabs the wooden baseball bat my grandpa keeps under his seat, locks the doors, and then exits the car. Keep calling my name. I can't see you, she cries. After what feels like an eternity, she follows my grandpa's voice to his location. When she gets to him, she realizes my grandpa needed help because he is guiding my aunt across the high, rain-soaked grass. She hurt her ankle. They are both drenched from mud and rain and covered in scratches. The rest of my family is nowhere in sight. Before my grandma can assume the worst, she hears my uncle calling for my grandpa. 
One by one, everyone shuffles out of the wild woods and through the tall grass. Everyone is soaked in mud and injured in some capacity. Cuts, gashes, limping, unsteady. All are shaken as well. When they finally make it back to their vehicles, the sounds of running engines and the flood of headlights gets the attention of the man inside the farmhouse. The farmhouse door swings open and the brawny man comes to stand on the porch. With an amused chuckle, he drawls, Oh, you all made it out of there. My grandpa shouts, That dumb asshole left us out there and never came back. All the man says in response is, I'll have to talk to him about that. You all can come inside. His freakishly flippant and joking attitude sinks into his words. He knows damn well they aren't going into his house. My grandma begs my grandpa to leave it and get them out of here. With that, my family tears out of there as fast as humanly possible. Once my family was back home and safe, my grandpa explained what had happened. During the ride, the guide led them deep into the woods to a creek, where the horses stopped for a drink. As the horses rested, the guide told my family he had to go do something and would be back in 20 minutes. My family thought this was strange and my grandpa even anxiously joked, you're coming back, right? The guide simply gave a low chuckle and took off on his horse. 20 minutes came and went and the guide didn't return. My family continued to wait as they had no idea where to go. They could see the sky blackening above them. They would have to make it out on their own. As my family rode off, they tried to remember the path back to the farm. They wandered aimlessly. Eventually, rain started to fall. Pulsing lightning and the crash of thunder spooked the horses. Everyone but my grandpa got thrown off their horses. When my grandpa climbed off his horse to help the others, his own horse galloped away as well. From there, it was a nightmare trying to navigate the woods while wounded and roaming through a thick void of darkness. The only advice I can give you is this. If you're going horseback riding, you better make sure it doesn't become a horseback ride from hell. So I grew up in rural South Georgia and lived with my parents and several siblings on a large farm. Most of my family grew up believing in paranormal activity, mostly due to our Native American heritage. My dad, on the other hand, was a staunch non-believer and would always discount our encounters as hogwash or overactive imaginations. My mom said for years that she would be woken during the night by disembodied voices. She said that it would sound like a room full of people where you couldn't hear a single conversation but could tell the overall mood of the room. The activity would heighten around pivotal times in her life death of her mom, brother. For years, my dad would laugh it off and say he's never heard a thing. Even after all the kids moved out. Fast forward several years later and my dad had been diagnosed with large and small cell lymphoma and went through chemo lost hair and lost significant weight. I stayed with him around Christmas of 2020 and I vividly remember him telling me that he is routinely wakened by the same voices that he had discounted for decades. He said that he would check the house to make sure that no TVS or radios were running elsewhere because the chatter was so loud. He ended up passing away from cancer in March of 2021. Looking back on it, I wonder if the voices were warning or welcoming him to his final outcome. So a while ago I went to my grandma's hometown in Mexico. She told me about not going to the creek at night, as there is some sort of water spirits that would steal children. I found this interesting and decided to investigate, and that day when the sun was going down I made my way to the creek. It was quite the long walk and isolated, but soon enough I started hearing drums and other types of instruments coming from that direction. The closer I got, the louder they got, and when I was a few yards away, it suddenly stopped, and I felt like I was being watched anyways. I made my way back home because I'm not dumb enough and had a terrible nightmare. It felt so real, and the only reason I snapped out of the dream was because my grandma heard me shout while sleeping and proceeded to cleanse me with an egg. It was a really weird experience and would like to find more info or similar experiences on this.
I'll never forget the passing of my aunt around four years ago. It was a natural cause, and she had always been a devout churchgoer. Her two daughters, both in their twenties at the time, were deeply affected by her departure. Coming from a Mexican background, our customs dictate that when someone passes away, we hold a novenario, which involves a series of prayers conducted over a nine-day period. On the ninth day, we bid farewell to our loved one and allow them to rest in peace. On that significant ninth day, my two cousins were lying in bed, still mourning the loss of their mother. According to them, my aunt appeared before them, comforting them and reassuring them not to worry about her. She told them she was going to a better place and that she was okay. She urged them not to mourn her because their grief was holding her back from moving on. This experience has taught me a valuable lesson. We should allow our loved ones to find peace in their passing and not cling to their memory in a way that prevents them from transitioning to the afterlife. It's a reminder that we will reunite with them one day, and until then, we should cherish their memories, celebrate their lives, and grant them the tranquility they deserve. Losing someone we love is undoubtedly painful, but understanding that they have embarked on a journey to a better place can bring solace and acceptance. Our beliefs, rituals, and traditions provide us with the strength and guidance to navigate the grieving process. And while it may be challenging to let go, we must trust in the natural order of things and allow our loved ones to find eternal peace. So, let us honor their memory, celebrate their life, and cherish the time we had together. Rest assured one day, we will be reunited, and until then, we can find comfort in knowing that they are watching over us from a place of serenity. When I first saw the Shadow Men, it would have been about eight years old. My family of five had just moved to a three-bedroom house around the time when my youngest brother was eight months old. I should mention that this house was in a well-populated neighborhood, not in the countryside. This house had a large basement that was split long ways into two sides. One side had a laundry room in the far back, a bathroom, a round mirror right outside of the bathroom on the opposing wall, and what we called the toy room right next to the stairs. The other side was the family den. The stairs to the basement separated these two sections. I hadn't been in that house for more than a week when I had first seen it. I was in the basement getting something, either a toy or a book, I don't recall. It was around late afternoon. The light was streaming in from the egress windows. At first, I thought it was my father, but I quickly realized that this figure was not only a head taller than he was, but thinner too. It also didn't have a reflection. If I had to give an estimate now, I'd say it stood maybe six and a half feet tall. It wasn't thin like some depictions I've seen. The one I saw that day had the typical fleshed out proportions of a man. At this point, only a few seconds had passed. I just stood there staring at it. I had a pit in my stomach and I knew even though I couldn't see its eyes, it saw me too. I cannot emphasize this enough. This wasn't a human. I was alone in that basement. The light coming from the windows didn't seem to cast any shadows onto it. There's no face, no clothes, and no indication of a three-dimensional form. The thing almost looked like it was a hole cut from the fabric of reality itself. The sense of dread and fear that filled me was something I'd only experienced while facing these creatures. I can't explain it, but something deep down told me that it was male. Something also told me that was evil. It said nothing. It just stood there. I took a step back and suddenly it charged at me taking incredibly long strides. The way it moved made it contort. The legs especially looked like they were getting longer. It reached out to me. The hand was as big as my face. It was only three feet away from me. It moved at incredible speed. I started to scream and I ran up the stairs. I ran out of the basement so fast that I actually fell when I reached the main hallway. I told my parents. My father was skeptical and obviously looked, but found nothing. My mother said nothing about it. A few days after the encounter in the evening hours, my sister and I saw one sitting on the sectional couch in our living room while we were walking to the kitchen for a snack. It was sitting where my mother would sit in the corner of the sectional. 
His legs were long. The minute it noticed us, my younger sister saw it and screamed. It left the couch in one human-like motion and ran through the wall. My mother was in the kitchen and my father was at work. That very night I saw one at my baby brother's nursery window pressing his face on the glass. I knew this one wasn't a person either. My neighbor's backyard porch light was on so this one, much like the first, was completely black like a shadow. My dad went outside with the flashlight. My neighbor joined in the search because they thought it was a pervert trying to spy on us kids. Nothing was found, no footprints at the window, no one fleeing the scene, and no prints on the glass pane. During the next three years, my sister and I would mention these continued sightings to our parents. Each time I was told it was nonsense and to stop terrorizing my siblings with ghost stories and lies. My younger sister mentioned her own sightings that I had never witnessed. I don't know the details. My mother eventually caved and admitted that she saw them too, primarily in the basement. She begged my sister and me to stop talking about them so my brother wouldn't be frightened. She even took us downstairs to pray over the space so that they'd maybe leave. Well, right around the time my brother learned to talk, he mentioned playing with the dude. The dude would play with him often, apparently when no one else would. He described it as a tall, dark figure, but this one is apparently neutral toward him. He mentioned him for years until he turned nine. Then he stopped talking about the dude completely. My parents divorced when I was about 12 and my mother and her new husband had two more sons. The older of these two boys, M, was about four, he started talking about what he called the Shadow Man. The Shadow Man was neutral toward him. I'm now in my 20s and I've kept seeing them throughout my life. It's pretty infrequent now, admittedly. When I see them, there's still a great dread when they just drift into the walls without approaching me. I added a quick illustration to this email of the shadow that I saw the first time. It seemed to ooze pure evil. I hope this story helps someone out there realize they aren't alone. Since then, I've come to terms with these experiences. So as a Marine, my first assignment took me to good old U.S. A. G. Yongsen in Korea. It had a rich history, once serving as an Imperial Japanese Army base during a dark time when the Japanese were exerting their control over the Korean Peninsula. I recall seeing an Imperial chrysanthemum still adorning the 8th Army HQ, reminding us of its past. However, there was a lesser-known corner of the base where a peculiar building stood possibly a storage facility for the hospital or something of the sort. This place had towering walls that seemed to guard its secrets, and it had been rumored to be a special hospital during the Japanese occupation. There were countless stories circulating among staff duty officers about encountering eerie phenomena while conducting their checks. As for me, I was assigned to overnight guard duty at the United Nations Command HQ in Yonsen. About three to four years prior, a fellow NCO approached the guard, requested his weapon, and tragically took his own life in the gazebo located at the back of the headquarters. So the building itself was equipped with automatic front doors and surveillance cameras that monitored the area outside the entrance. On one particular night, around 2 a.m., my friend and I noticed a dark, shadowy figure ascending the ramp towards the entrance, and our initial thought was, probably the sergeant of the guard just great. I stepped out of the guard post to brief him while my buddy stayed inside, keeping an eye on the camera feed. To our surprise, both the inner and outer automatic doors opened, but there was no one there. I thought to myself, ah, uh, the SOG must be playing tricks on us, so I quickly stepped outside the building to investigate, but there was no sign of anyone. Puzzled, I returned inside and asked my friend where the person had gone. He gave me a bewildered look and informed me that he had witnessed the figure entering the building. We discussed what had occurred and came to the chilling conclusion that it must have been the ghost of the NCO, making his phantom rounds as the SOG. From that point on, I adamantly refused to pull another night shift in that building. The unnerving experience had left an indelible mark on my psyche, and I deemed it best to avoid any further encounters with the supernatural within those walls.
On the evening of July 7, 2007, I was patrolling a swampy area in Lauderdale County, Mississippi as a police officer. The moon cast an eerie glow, creating an atmosphere of mystery. As I drove, my headlights caught two red dots reflecting back at me. Intrigued, I approached the source and discovered an unusual creature. It resembled an alligator, but with distinct legs and arms that ended in thumbs. The creature stood upright, just like a human, walking with a peculiar gait. The sighting lasted for about 20 seconds before it vanished into the darkness under the thick tree canopy. There were no nearby houses, and this location wasn't far from where several alligators had been spotted earlier that week. It was impossible to mistake this creature for any other animal. I immediately reported the incident to my supervisor, who was taken aback by my account. In the morning, a request was made for a helicopter equipped with thermal imaging devices, but our search yielded no results. Speculation arose that the creature I witnessed might be the Lizard Man, a figure intertwined with the legend of the Mothman. One of the earliest reported sightings of the Lizard Man came from an oil rig worker in Scarberry, West Virginia. According to local residents, there are caves in the nearby swamps where bodies were allegedly experimented on during World War Roman II by Japanese scientists under Operation Paperclip. Some believe these experiments may have given rise to the existence of these lizard-like beings, but such claims remain speculative. There are other infamous cases, such as the Lizard Man of Scape or Swamp in South Carolina during the 1980s. A young man encountered a large humanoid lizard while dealing with car troubles by the roadside. The creature gave chase, leaving a lasting impression on the witness. Another account came from a hunter who claimed to have seen a seven-foot-tall lizard walking into the swamp trying to make eye contact before disappearing into the water. This less known encounter took place three years after the young man's incident, but the hunter's description matched the drawing of the creature made by the boy. Similar sightings of these creatures have been reported in various locations worldwide, including Central and South America, Africa, Australia, Japan, and China. Witnesses often describe them as bipedal reptiles with scales, even Native American folklore tells tales of giant lizard-like monsters that prey on humans, particularly children. Some cultures revered lizard-like beings as gods, while others viewed them as savage man-eaters or demonic entities. Sheriff Billy Soley of Lauderdale County acknowledged that they haven't found concrete evidence to prove or disprove the creature's existence. However, they remain open to investigation. Local residents and those near the area continue their search, hoping to uncover any evidence that might shed light on these sightings. In conclusion, I would like to emphasize that there are numerous first-hand reports and encounters with these creatures. We must handle this information with care, ensuring it doesn't fall into the wrong hands or cause unnecessary panic. If you have any additional information or have had a personal encounter with this creature, please reach out to me via email. This happened to myself and a close friend, both 23-year-old males, just last month. We decided to go on a two-night backpacking or camping trip in the Adirondack Mountains of New York. We are both very comfortable with nature and spend a lot of time camping, hunting, fishing, etc. We hiked about five miles into a small lake and set up camp on a small beach. This was not a heavily trafficked area and we did not expect to run into anyone. Our first night there as we were sitting around the fire, we saw a flashlight moving on the other side of the lake around 10.30. This was fairly unusual, however we did not think too much of it. But as time went on, this flashlight kept moving around the lake getting closer to our campsite. We kept discussing who could possibly be wandering around the woods in the middle of the night, and we did not particularly want an unwelcomed guest. Once it was clear that the person or people were heading for our campsite, we moved off into the woods nearby to see who wandered up. I took a small axe with me, and he had a .22 rifle. Now we weren't expecting trouble, and we certainly didn't want to make any, but we figured we might as well cover our bases. Now the moment of truth, the flashlight comes near the light of our fire, and it is one man. 
He has a beard and is probably in his mid-40s. The scary part was he was carrying what turned out to be a pump-action shotgun. He walked around the campsite a few times and then proceeded to enter our tent. After rummaging around for a minute or so, he came out and started yelling, I know you're out there, why don't you come and say hello? My friend and I remained motionless under a hemlock tree about 50 yards away. That is when the man proceeded to fire his shotgun into the woods, not too far from where we were. He also swung his flashlight around several times. After what felt like hours, he grabbed my friend's backpack and a few articles of clothing we had drying off near the fire and threw them in to burn. My friend, who had trained the point .22 at the man, asked me if he should shoot. I told him absolutely not, unless he spots us and starts to point the gun in our direction. Thankfully, the man moved off from where he had come after a little while. We waited until his flashlight was on the other side of the lake, ran out, grabbed everything we could fit in my pack, and took off it was now around 2 or 3 a.m. We ran out the trail with flashlights and made it back to my car as the sun was coming up. We immediately went to the police department and reported it, where we also spoke with some forest rangers. That was it. I haven't heard anything back from the police. It wasn't mysterious, however it creeped the hell out of both of us. This summer I was out in the dark canyon wilderness of Utah after two weeks of driving and backpacking around the country alone. The plan was a seven-day trip, and after a few days of setbacks, I was on my last night. By this time, I was already a little scared of the dark, but that's just what happens when you are your only company for three weeks. Anyway, on the sixth day, I found an awesome elk antler and put it on my shoulders about a mile into the day's hike. As anyone who has poorly packed a pack will attest just slapping 15 pounds on the top of your pack is a bad idea. About halfway through my planned death march my hip was getting sore and I blew through my water. I decided that I would stop early and get some water. Luckily I found a few puddles in a Driesch river bed and made camp. I started boiling some water when it struck me. If there's skanky water here there may be good water upstream. So up I went upstream. Just as the canyon boxed out, a little spring filled the bed with deliciously cold, refreshing water. I drank on my hands and knees before realizing I didn't bring my water bottles. Whatever I hiked the half mile or so back to the camp and grabbed them. This is where it gets weird. On my trip back up, I kept feeling really vulnerable and uncomfortable. Every little rustle in the bushes set me off. I could hear birds calling in the distance that set me off. I kept looking for something following me. I can only describe my emotion as pure terror. It got to the point where I picked up a branch and the just in case a cougar tried to attack me. I still kept telling myself that it was just paranoia and I'm fine, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I finally got to the water and filled up my camelback and bottle, constantly looking over my shoulder. The feeling of unease was still with me when I headed back down the gulch. There I came upon a fresh mountain lion print placed directly between two that I made on the way up. It's one thing to think that your fears are unfounded paranoia. It's much, much worse to know they are true. The coastal town in Syria was no stranger to strife and chaos, but the unexplained disappearances that had gripped it lately were beyond anything we could have imagined. We were a Navy SEAL team, sent on a mission to investigate and, if possible, put an end to the sinister occurrences that had plagued the town. Our orders were simple yet cryptic. Gather information, find the source of the disappearances, and neutralize the threat. We had faced countless dangers in our line of work, but nothing could have prepared us for what awaited us beneath the waters of that forsaken place. As we approached the town under the cover of darkness, our senses were on high alert. The air was thick with tension, and the moon cast an eerie glow over the deserted streets. The locals were wary, their eyes filled with fear and distrust, but they offered no answers to our questions. Our investigation led us to a series of unusual events that all pointed to one place an underwater cave system near the coastal cliffs. 
The townsfolk whispered of a malevolent force that dwelled in the depths, but they spoke in hushed tones, too afraid to reveal the truth. We suited up in our diving gear, each of us carrying an array of specialized equipment, and ventured into the unknown. The entrance to the cave was hidden beneath the surface of the Inkai black waters, and as we descended into its depths, an unsettling feeling of dread settled over us. The cavernous interior of the cave was shrouded in darkness, illuminated only by the beams of our waterproof flashlights. The walls were slick with moisture, and the sound of our breathing echoed eerily through the tunnels. We pressed on, following a labyrinthine network of passages that seemed to stretch endlessly into the abyss. It wasn't long before we encountered something that defied all logic. The creature, if you could even call it that, was a monstrous entity that lurked in the shadows. It stood over six feet tall, its body covered with black fur that looked wet and matted, as if it had just emerged from the sea. The most unsettling aspect was its lack of forelegs. Instead, it possessed a pair of massive hind legs that seemed incredibly powerful. As we cautiously approached, the creature turned to face us, and its two piercing red eyes bore into our souls. It was as though it could see into the darkest corners of our minds, and the malevolence that emanated from it was palpable. Before we could react, the creature lunged at us with incredible speed and ferocity. Chaos erupted as we opened fire, our bullets finding their mark, but the beast refused to go down without a fight. In the midst of the battle, we lost one of our own, a comrade who had fought alongside us through countless missions. In the end, it was a hail of bullets that brought the creature down. Its lifeless body lay before us, a grotesque and enigmatic enigma. We called our team leader to arrange for the extraction of the creature's carcass, hoping it might provide answers to the unending mysteries of this place. But when the extraction team arrived, they weren't government agents as we had expected. Instead, they belonged to an unknown agency, shrouded in secrecy. They took the creature's carcass without a word, leaving us with more questions than answers. We demanded an explanation, but the operatives remained silent. With a wave of their hands, they signaled for us to depart. As we boarded the waiting chopper, we couldn't shake the feeling that we had just stumbled upon something beyond our comprehension, something that lay hidden in the shadows of the world. The chopper lifted off, leaving the coastal town behind, and we were left with a lingering sense of confusion and unease. The creature we had encountered defied all logic, and the agency that had taken it away seemed equally enigmatic. Our mission had ended, but the mysteries of that coastal town and the secrets of the deep continued to haunt us. We were Navy SEALs, trained to face the worst of the worst, but this was a battle unlike any we had ever fought, and the questions that lingered would remain unanswered, locked away in the depths of the unknown. One particular incident from my life has remained etched in my memory, its peculiarities haunting me to this day. It happened during a hiking expedition through a vast and secluded timber plantation. Accompanied by a guide and a few friends, we ventured deep into the wilderness, far from any signs of civilization. We had been trekking for several hours, planning to take a well-deserved break, when something caught our attention in the distance. It was an old car, parked approximately 100 yards ahead of us. Given the remote location, my initial assumption was that the car had been abandoned, so I paid little heed to it. However, as we approached, the details became clearer. Inside the vehicle, I spotted a weathered man, around 60 years old, occupying the driver's seat. Beside him sat a young boy, his face etched with fear. Both of them fixed their gaze upon us, their eyes filled with intensity. My instinctive urge was to approach them and inquire if they needed any assistance. However, before I could act upon it, our guide silently altered our course, veering away from the scene and hastening our pace. Strangely enough, none of us mentioned the incident afterward. It's as if a silent agreement had been forged to keep it buried within our collective memories. Nevertheless, the enigma persists, and the mere thought of why that man and the boy were in the heart of the woods with the car turned off and windows sealed, watching us so intently sends chills down my spine.
I talked to an old hippie pot farmer who lives in the vicinity of Takoma in extreme southern Oregon south of Grants Pass. He stated that it was common knowledge among his cohorts that there were many Bigfoot in the Red Butts and that they tended to be territorial and aggressive. He said that to enter the Red Butts was to risk confrontation with these creatures. You have to hike a long ways to enter this area. It's an area of deep valleys and high, forested ridges and butts. Another report from the same general area concerns two forestry workers who had driven up a very remote road near the headwaters of the Smith River, which flows south into California to join the Klamath. They had pulled over and walked to the edge of an embankment. Looking down into the creek below, they saw a large group of big feet pulling salmon from the creek. They were noticed and two large males started up the embankment. They jumped into their truck and as they sped away saw the two males come over the embankment and onto the road. Also heard that of a couple of fellows in Grants Pass who used to hunt illegally using salt licks. They stated that on several occasions they found large Bigfoot tracks around the licks and found that large chunks had been bitten out of the salt lick. Several years ago, shortly after I'd gotten into long distance cycling, I decided to ride from Seattle out to Iron Horse Park for an overnight camping trip. I'm poodling along the gravel path through forest on a day unusually damp, gray and rainy for August and get the creepiest, most unsettling feeling. I pick up my pace, looking carefully around at the impenetrable Pacific Northwest forest on either side, convinced I'm being stalked. If you've ever experienced these endless, dark forests of Douglas fir, Sitka spruce, ferns and moss, you know how dark, damp and unsettling they can be. Luckily, the feeling passed after a bit and I finished the rest of the adventure without issue. Got back that weekend and decided to look up via Google Maps just how deep in the woods I was when I got that horrible feeling. And discovered to my embarrassment, it was a thin band of trees on either side of the trail just deep enough to block my views of massive cow pastures on either side. Last year around this time, June 28, 2021, my friend, we will call her Dana, my other friend, calling him Jana, and I all went on a camping trip. It was deep in the woods in Alberta, Canada. The trip was going good. It was in the middle of nowhere. No cell service, no bars, nothing but we pained, listened to music and all that jazz. One day, Dana and Jana were both sleeping in the tent. It was 2 p.m. and I was sitting alone outside. I start hearing this screaming. John, John, help me. John, where are you? And that repeated four times the same way, same spacing. I'm not going to die in the woods, so I didn't check it out. I stayed where I sat. When the other two got up, I explained what I heard. Me and Dana went to the river that was close by, leaving Jana alone at the tent. We came back 40 minutes later and Jana is sitting his pants. He explained that he heard the exact same thing as me, including how the pauses where I explained the pauses when I told them both about the screaming a few months later me and Jana went back there, but the two of us. On the last day, me and Jana had this gut feeling that we were going to die if we stayed the last night. It was one of the gut feelings that you trust. And I know it wasn't anxiety, this feeling was literal terror. And we're going back there with Dana in a few days. First of all, let me start off by saying this is not a joke. This is a genuine sighting report. It was half past two in the morning and it was completely silent. I was in the bathroom cleaning my teeth getting ready for bed, when suddenly I heard the letterbox lift up and violently slam, as though someone had purposely done this to get my attention. Usually, when it is very windy, the letterbox will bang and clutter, but never this loud. Besides, it was completely calm outside with no wind at all, so I found it rather strange and quite perplexing that it had slammed like that. I quickly finished off and rinsed my mouth, placed my toothbrush down on the side, and then quickly went downstairs to look out the hallway window and see if there was anyone outside mucking around at this ungodly hour of the morning. At first, I couldn't see anything, 
But when I looked along the hedgerow, I saw what I first thought was someone large hunched over on the path. I moved the net curtain to get a better look, and it moved slightly, becoming more visible within the streetlight and moonlight combined. Now this is going to sound really farcical and strange, but I could now clearly see that it was not a human. It looked just like a werewolf and had a long snout like it was straight out of a Hollywood horror movie which sent chills rushing through my spine. It turned its head and looked at me the light causing its eyes to shine reflecting some light. It was good that I had previously been to the bathroom before seeing this creature, or I would have needed a clean set of underpants. I bravely banged on the window pane and it darted away hunched over. After it ran down the road setting off many security lights in the process, I promptly retreated away from the window letting go of the net curtain still in complete shock. I bucked up the courage to walk down the stairs and check the front door just to make sure it was still locked and secured which fortunately, it still was. I then swiftly went back upstairs and went straight into my bedroom where I sat down on the bed still in disbelief at what I had witnessed. It scared me because it's not something you typically see. Had this werewolf creature seemingly slammed the letterbox to get my attention so that I would look out the window and see it and be terrified, which I actually was. After studying ufology and cryptid creatures for over two decades now, I can confidently state that they are just a generated construct within our reality. Yes, it is a real physical werewolf that is dangerous and could tear anyone limb from limb who was unfortunate enough to be outside and unwittingly run into this deadly savage beast. But it is a generated construct that has been placed there purposely by an unseen intelligence to cause fear and stifle my research by putting the frighteners on me. This is possible because we are living in a quantum simulation and therefore anything generated can be real to us. I have come to this conclusion because I have witnessed this phenomenon firsthand changing shape and form on many separate occasions. I have seen a Mothman and a Goatman, and I have photographed a hideous merman creature at Hope's Nose, Torquay. I've also seen a man with a lizard's head and many other strange anomalous things that people would find farcical and hard to believe. We are definitely living in a simulated reality controlled by invisible outside forces whose agenda is totally unknown to us. And these generated cryptid creatures can become a reality within our world at any time and seemingly at any place. This encounter took place at 2.30 in the early hours of the morning on the 1st of June, 2023 at Newton Abbott, Devon, England. All the best. Not a sighting, but hearing two very unusual howls in the woods behind my property October 1st, shortly after midnight full moon too. So it was almost like your classical horror movie script. I live in the town of New Portland, Maine. Lived in the Maine woods all my life, and I am very familiar with the sounds of local wildlife. It certainly weren't coyotes, as I hear them mostly every night. Not Bigfoot-like sounds either as I looked up on the internet. Two short howls about 20 seconds apart from each other, canine in nature, but deeper and louder big lungs. Hard to determine the proximity, could have been as far away as a half a mile from my property. But it sounded nearby nonetheless and I had a strong gut reaction to better go inside, while I have never felt threatened by any wildlife sounds before. Just reporting this as backup in case there would be reports of sightings in this area. I also like to report a possible sighting that a friend told me. In August of 2016 early evening he got chased out of a farm in Lexington, Me, which is not too far from here. He is an avid hunter and he described it as something way bigger than a bear or a moose. He was alerted by his two Rottweilers in the back of his truck going in full panic mode when he saw something huge standing on two legs next behind a tree 20 ft away in his rear view mirror. It then leapt on all fours toward his truck. He started the truck and bolted out of there, seeing the thing chase him in the mirror for a short while. Don't think he reported it as he still can't really accept what he saw, and he doesn't like talking about it. I did not know about Dogman back then when he told me. Just started researching after I heard the unusual howls I heard a couple of days ago. I hope this is useful to you. My experience was not a visual encounter, 
but hearing unusual howls, unusual enough to start searching the internet. I listened to the audios on the link you sent me. Honestly, what I heard was not alike any of those, although it came closest to the third audio, which sounded more like coyote to me. What I heard was the howl being shorter in duration, but deeper and louder. Exactly this aspect suggests that it was bigger than a coyote, wolf, or dog. That and a gut feeling being very, very uncomfortable and feeling I need to go inside quickly. Like I said, I hear the coyotes almost every night around here. That howl was one time only, have not heard it since, and I am glad of that. The sighting in Lexington 2016 was by a friend of mine. He told me once, just after it happened, but still can't come to terms with what he saw, and he rather not talk about it. I had never heard of Dogman back then. It wasn't until I started researching your site and other material two weeks ago that I connected the dots and realized that was probably what he had seen and what I might have heard. Altogether, I thought I report it as a confirmation in case of other reports in this area. When I think back to my high school days, a peculiar memory always comes to mind. It was a long time ago, but the events remain vivid in my mind, as if they happened just yesterday. One gloomy afternoon, my buddies and I received news of our friend's grandmother's passing. They lived in a secluded area, far from the bustling city and surrounded by nature's embrace. It was a place where the wind whispered secrets and shadows danced in the moonlight. A week after the funeral, seeking solace and distraction, we decided to go fishing. As we cast our lines into the calm waters, laughter mingled with the gentle ripples of the lake. Little did we know that an eerie surprise awaited us upon our return. As we approached my friend's grandmother's house, our eyes widened with disbelief. The lights inside were inexplicably switched on. A chill crept up my spine, and a sense of unease settled in the air. My friend confessed that this had been happening ever since his grandmother's passing. With a sense of duty mixed with trepidation, we entered the house and promptly turned off the lights. We decided to distract ourselves and headed out to grab a bite to eat. An hour passed, and as we returned, our hearts sank at the sight before us the lights were on once again. Baffled and intrigued, we flicked the switches back to darkness, our minds spinning with possibilities. Could it be a faulty electrical system, or perhaps an unexplained quirk of the house? Determined to uncover the truth, we ventured into every nook and cranny, clutching a gun for a false sense of security. But our search yielded no results. There was no trace of anyone within those walls. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.